Um, thank you for uh, thank you for being here. There's still some people uh, at the entrance, but we need to we need to start. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for being here. It's a real pleasure to to host this event at the European Parliament. We're extremely grateful to our host, uh, Mr. Hebrandi, for having facilitated uh, the access to, to this venue, but also for uh, you know, helping us to, to bring together a number of, 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 uh, of people representing a number of institutions that we believe that if we work together, we could, uh, we could uh, make a difference in, the, in, 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 in achieving the sustainable development goals, uh, in particular by uh, promoting and by uh, and by taking action in innovation. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. Fernando Diaz Lopez. I am the director of InnoforSD. It's an initiative uh, funded by the European Commission, created from the Horizon 2020 project uh, Green.eu. And um, I will be your, your, uh, I'm your host. I'm the person who has been contacting you. And uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, today we have uh, um, personalities uh, from different uh, from different entities here today. Um, the, the event should close at, uh, at, at one o'clock. I just have one practical uh, um, um, message for you that uh, some, of you, um, um, some of you will join us for dinner. Please join uh, and meet my, my, my colleague James in the back uh, for, for, uh, for the dinner, uh, for the information and the vouchers for dinner. But also we have, we have one of these for you, uh, not because we're making an announcement for anything, but this is uh, a way of, of decreasing our carbon footprint in events. And please uh, also see James uh, uh, for that. So I will, uh, without, without further introduction, I will leave the floor to our moderator, Mr. Peter Woodward, who will guide us uh, throughout, the, throughout the, the keynotes of today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Fernando. And a good morning uh, from me. My name is Peter Woodward, uh, uh, independent uh, moderator. Uh, delighted to be involved over the next three days, um, helping to really work through uh, that huge challenge of exciting opportunity uh, we face in terms of living up to the promise of the uh, 17 Sustainable de uh, Development Goals, but looking very much at how um, uh, new collaboration uh, developing systems approaches, looking very much at the uh, issue around uh, innovation and science and technology as drivers of a systemic change in the way uh, we live our lives uh, and our economy that supports a quality of life uh, for all. Huge challenges we face. We're learning insights all the time. It's great uh, this morning in the European Parliament to be having uh, some initial thought and conversation about where we're at, uh, how are we driving forward, and maybe what are some of those barriers, but also solutions that mean that at scale and at pace uh, we are moving in the right uh, direction. Uh, so for the first part, um, I'm delighted that we have a, a number of uh, speakers to offer us perspectives uh, from uh, different uh, arenas, and part of the hallmark of this a conference is about uh, making connections, about uh, collaboration. So we're going to hear different key perspectives. And then in the second part, we're going to open up a, a panel discussion, really trying to work out how fit for purpose or more we need to do to make sure that the brilliance of innovation uh, and ideas underpinned by science uh, actually gain traction in the real world uh, of transformation. So in this first part, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a number of uh, speakers who are going to uh, offer interventions. Um, I will uh, just int introduce them uh, as they are about to speak. Each of them will speak for around about uh, 15 or so uh, minutes. Uh, and then, as I say, we will have a follow-up panel discussion uh, with a, a fresh set of, 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 uh, uh, of panelists. So, delighted to start um, right at the far end, um, uh, on your left, uh, delighted to welcome um, uh, Patrick Child, uh, Deputy Director General of DG Research and Innovation um, at the European Commission, uh, responsible for 
um, a policy for management and implementation of a 77 billion euro research and innovation program. So you are clearly, absolutely at the, uh, at the heart uh, of trying to ensure that that uh, resource uh, is deployed in the most effective way. Thank you very much uh, indeed for joining us this morning and we look forward to uh, one or two thoughts and insights um, uh, as we try to take the most effective journey uh, forward. So uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Child. Well, thank you very much and very happy to be here. Um, thanks to uh, inno 4 sd for organising this and also to Mr. Uh, Gerbandli for his uh, uh, support and facilitation of this important event. Um, uh, we're very happy uh, in the European Commission to support in initiatives like uh, the Horizon 2020 Green EU uh, project and uh, the activities that that has able to generate, in, in particular uh, the uh, Innov 4 SD uh, dimension. Um, what we're trying to do with this Green EU initiative is to create a large network of stakeholders from academia, policymaking, and business coming together to discuss the uh, uh, urgent global challenges at an international level uh, in a systemic manner uh, through investment in uh, sustainable development. And this symposium is a, a very practical result of this uh, objectives of this project um, and, a, and a very good platform, we believe, for uh, discussion on how research and knowledge can and must contribute to our sh shared endeavors uh, to address the sustainable development goals. Um, it also, I think, makes possible uh, collaboration with other uh, similar initiatives that uh, are flourishing in other parts of the world. Um, uh, the f uh, things like Future Earth, the Sustainable, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, uh, the Japan Science and Technology a Agency, and the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. Uh, and so we have high hopes for the discussions that we're going to have today, that you will come up with some uh, very practical and operational suggestions on how we can work together using the leverage of research and innovation uh, to uh, address uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, of course, we're having this meeting at a rather critical moment in the global discussion. Uh, we all are very familiar with the recent uh, special report of the IPCC on the 1.5 uh, degree scenario um, and the rather sort of um, sobering message that on present plans that governments around the world including in the European Union uh, are likely to fall short of their 2015 Paris Agreement commitments. Um, similarly um, if we look at the report on the um, intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, the IPBES, uh, we see that uh, land de degradation is uh, undermining the well-being of 3.2 billion people and is root cause of migration of millions of people by 2050 uh, and potentially uh, presenting global challenges on the same uh, sort of dimensions as uh, climate change. Um, uh, and I just also highlight the findings of the Lancet Commission report in 2017 on disease caused by pollution, um, which were responsible for an estimated 9 million premature deaths in 2015. So 16% of deaths worldwide, and three times more deaths than from the major diseases like AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. So I think that you know these elements coming together underline the urgency and the scale of the challenge that we face. Um, uh, in order to address these challenges, international uh, cooperation, um, in particular on science, technology, and innovation, uh, will be fundamental. Um, uh, the European Commission is present in many global discussions, uh, in particular in the context of the United Nations. Uh, we're working closely through the uh, technology facilitation mechanism, as well as the UNEP uh, Science, Business, and Policy Forum. Uh, science funded by Horizon 2020, our uh, framework program, uh, was fundamental uh, in the work of the IPCC and in particular in the recent report that I mentioned uh, a moment ago. And we're also working very closely with international partners in initiatives like Mission Innovation on Clean Energy Innovation uh, or the Group of Earth um, Observation. I was at the, um, uh, the annual plenary meeting of the GEO group group of Earth Observation uh, last week in Kyoto and there the, you know, the, uh, the 
the, the role that we as European Union are playing in that, I think, is uh, very important, not just through the work of the Commission, but of also the very strong support that we have from many of the EU member states. I want to spend just a moment uh, recalling some of the things, though, that the European Commission is specifically working on in this area. Um, I mean, so as we all know, sustainable development is in the founding treaty of the European Union uh, and is therefore at the heart of all our policies and actions. Uh, the Commission, presided by President Juncker, um, is taking bold steps, in particular in seeing how we can use all our policy instruments uh, to support sustainable development and the SDGs, um, uh, and in particular, uh, as far as you know, my work is concerned, how we can harness the uh, potential of uh, research and innovation in areas like the, um, uh, the Energy Union, where we recently had a, a quite important uh, initiative communication on accelerating clean energy innovation, uh, and the uh, paper that we're all working on now very actively coming up uh, under a request from Europe's leaders in the European Council to produce uh, before the next uh, COP meeting in Poland uh, a, a strategy for um, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the period running up to uh, 2050. Um, Horizon 2020, uh, as we've heard, is the uh, largest uh, publicly funded uh, research and innovation program in the world, uh, promoting international collaboration in science, technology and in innovation. Uh, we have a total budget approaching 80 billion euros over a seven-year period, of which 60% um, is uh, devoted to uh, activities linked to sustainable um, development. And that turns out as roughly 6.5 billion euros of uh, research and innovation funding per year until 2020. We are at the same time now working on preparations for our next framework program. It will be called Horizon Europe. Uh, the Commission made proposals for this new framework program as part of the overall package of uh, financial instruments that we put forward for the next uh, medium-term budget uh, period for the EU, uh, which runs from 2021 to 2027. Um, uh, and through Horizon Europe, we are determined to continue to strengthen and mainstream sustainable development uh, and, and our support for the Agenda 2030. We proposed a, an increased budget for Horizon Europe, uh, 100 billion for the seven year period, uh, with a specific target of 35% uh, devoted to climate action. And that's the only uh, sort of headline uh, global target that we've got, which I think underlines the political importance that the Commission attaches to uh, taking urgent action in this area. Now, these proposals are still under discussion uh, with our member states and in the European Parliament. Um, we hope that there will be some sort of political conclusions uh, towards the spring of next year uh, in advance of the European Parliament elections and the new mandate of the European Commission. And we're working very closely and actively with the different um, actors to achieve that. Um, within the uh, proposal that we put forward, uh, there are five main uh, thematic clusters addressing big international global challenges and, uh, and also underlining the importance of in industrial competitiveness. One of these... Um, clusters is specifically devoted to uh, energy, climate and mobility, which I'm sure will be a very strong focus of the work that we will be doing uh, in this area in, in the future. Um, we are also um, uh, highlighting in our Horizon Europe proposals the importance of international collaboration, cooperation in addressing uh, key global challenges and helping us therefore to get access not only to the best uh, science and research that's available in the European Union but also at a global level. Um, uh, just to um, uh, complete what we've uh, been doing or are doing in the Commission, uh, I guess many of you will be familiar with the uh, communication that the Commission adopted in 2016 on uh, the next steps for sustainable European future. This outlines how the European Commission sees uh, Europe implementing the sustainable development goals, uh, both in its internal and external policies, setting out uh, a number of objectives in terms of governance, finance and measurement of progress. 
Uh, and this communication puts very clearly in the forefront the importance of accelerating the role of science and technology and innovation as a means for creating new business opportunities and jobs. And now we are working uh, on a sort of uh, stock-taking reflection paper uh, and a new strategy on sustainable Europe by 2030, which uh, we expect the Commission to adopt um, before the end of the year, you know, very much in line with the objectives of the uh, Juncker Commission. And we expect that um, what we can do still in the remaining years of the Horizon 2020 program and, of course, the future contributions of uh, our next framework program, Horizon Europe, uh, to be fully consistent with the policy orientations that will be contained in this uh, uh, report on the SDGs and also on the uh, communication I mentioned earlier on our future strategy for reducing greenhouse gases by 2050. Um, in conclusion, I um, just want to underline again the importance of the work of Innov uh, for SD as a network in shaping strategies at a European level and internationally um, in order to help us work towards uh, national sustainable development uh, uh, objectives and building into that um, science, technology and innovation. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I'd be very interested to see coming out of your deliberations during the course of the day would be whether and how um, individual countries and maybe the European Union could perhaps uh, draw inspirations from countries like Japan and Jamaica who are already working on their own uh, STI roadmaps to implement the SDGs uh, and to see whether this is a, a model that we could maybe follow uh, and, and build on as we work together in the European Union to address the very uh, acute and urgent global challenges that we collectively face. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you very much uh, indeed. <coughs> I know you have to travel onwards uh, to, uh, to further meetings, but thank you very much for, um, uh, for framing part of our conversation. Uh, it's clear that uh, uh, across many parts of the Euro Com uh, Euro European Commission there's a, there's a drive to connect with, uh, to support the uh, SDGs. Our conversations over the next few days will be, I'm sure, uh, filled with thought and ambition to help drive that from being something at the margins to be absolutely something at the heart uh, of, the, of the journey forwards. But uh, as you say, it's an exciting time of change and possibility. And I think part of the challenge of, of this meeting uh, over the next three days is to, is to provide with uh, people like uh, you with the uh, absolute um, uh, clarity of, uh, of ideas uh, that can inform uh, your development of policy and programme. So thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for your intervention. Um, as you mentioned, uh, a huge amount of effort uh, is taking place across uh, different um, countries across the globe, uh, different member states uh, within Europe. Clearly, when we get down to the national level, um, there are different uh, energies and initiatives that are in different ways uh, embracing the SDGs, uh, but also uh, looking at how uh, research uh, and innovation can be um, uh, a key uh, part of the change process. Uh, and to get a perspective uh, from uh, one of the member states uh, in Europe, from the, from the Netherlands, I'm delighted to welcome, uh, to offer some uh, comments, um, uh, Mr. Hugo uh, Meinfeld, uh, Minister Plenipotentiary for the SDGs, uh, Minister of, uh, 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 of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands, uh, so basically resp uh, responsible for um, trying to make sense and implementation of the global goals at, uh, uh, at a, uh, a national level. So, Hugo, great to have you uh, with us. Uh, and we look forward to just hearing one or two perspectives from yourself um, about uh, how we gain real traction and progress uh, around this crucial uh, agenda re related to research, technology and innovation to drive the SDGs forward. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, and uh, also uh, thank you very much to being invited for this uh, interesting uh, meeting. I try to make it even more interesting uh, with my speech. Um, and uh, although I'm not f f from such a 
interesting member states is uh, Jamaica, but uh, <laughs> the weather, though, is uh, going that way, uh, if I look at last summer. Um, let me start with a quotation, a quote. Um, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly towards it. Of course, John F. Kennedy, you recognized it, perhaps 1963, not flying to the moon, but um, it, it was about SDG 16. He didn't know then yet, <laughs> but uh, it was peace. And, but it's interesting that this language, um, this is the SDG language. Uh, you have a middle term uh, goal and um, so 2050 is perhaps too far away. Uh, 2020, uh, I understand in elections or in, uh, uh, at a CEO perspective, 2020 is a better year, but for the SDGs, um, all parties say this midterm review to 2030 is an excellent uh, year. And, and that's the, the dot on the horizon as the deputy director General said uh, the Horizon 2020, and now we will have the Horizon Europe. It's I think that that's a wonderful way how it can work. Um, so as you all know, in in the year 2015, a lot of good things happened. And not only Paris in December, but before Paris in September, uh, all 193 then uh, world leaders came together. Um, and they adopted the 17 quantified goals for the year 2030. Um, and it was, of course, not only uh, citizens that were attracted to these goals. Perhaps I must admit still I'm busy every day to make citizens aware of the existence of the SDGs, to be honest. Um, you could wonder if that it's so necessary to have a big full PR campaign to make these three letters aware with uh, a person in the street. But nevertheless, um, we have focused more on the professionals. Uh, perhaps not the bubble, the, the, the sustainability bubble, but, but the professionals in life. Uh, business, finance, uh, the governments, not to forget, um, they don't, do not automatically know of the SDGs or behave mm -hmm. like it. Um, so, um, again, um, I want to uh, say that uh, gradually, step by step, these, these midterm goals are gaining territory amongst those parties. Um, and um, only with the help of those goals, I think the, the programs like um, research, science, technology and innovation can flourish. Uh, that's what I'm told. I'm just a lawyer, by the way. but. Uh, people say, when you want to have better research um, and predictable policies, we need we need predictable goals. If you change the policy every year, um, how would people invest? Um, and how would uh, scientists work uh, on a longer term on, on all this work? Um, so I think that's also an, an, an argumentation uh, at least I see in my own country that that's, um, a lot of scientists and, and research companies uh, uh, are, let's say, welcoming the SDGs. Uh, finally, finally, there is some predictability in the policy. Um, so the second achievement is this first achievement is, is this predictability on the bit in the term. The second achievement is the ho it's holistic, difficult word. Um, it's, there is a social, social chapter, there is an environmental chapter, the economic chapter. I mentioned peace, uh, partnership. Um, the picture is complete. Of course, now, um, let's say perhaps it's too pro provocative. Uh, people say, yeah, I know an SDG 18. I've met many people who say this. I know 18. I said, come on, you go to the waiting room and in that, 2029, perhaps, we start a debate about what's next after 2030. <laughs> this is a gift. It's 
is leaders of the world who adopted this, this package. So let's enjoy our, our presence. And, and I'll say, I want one more. <laughs> um, so, uh, so is everything positive? I, I mentioned now two positive elements. Um, well, I would say um, one challenge comes to mind, and that is, uh, of course, we started with uh, uh, this holistic approach with 17 goals, 169 targets, uh, 144 uh, indicators, um, and you start fragmented, of course, because um, you start at, at a situation that exists already. And so I must admit, after three years, it's extremely difficult now to uh, regulate and, and organize everything along the 17 goals, in 17 chapters, so to say. Um, even my own uh, uh, cabinet, the, the Council of Ministers, uh, got a lot of letters. Uh, please, you, you have to write now this new coalition. Please do it in 17 chapters. But of course, that didn't happen. Um, I, made, I made a translation table, by the way. And more or less, everything is in this agreement. So perhaps also, uh, we, shouldn't panic, we should not panic too early. Um, perhaps it's, it's good to have such a document that translates the, the political agreement. Um, but um, it takes quite some time indeed uh, to, uh, uh, to set and, and, and explain how everything is linked to these goals. Uh, because why I'm saying this is not only that I like order and that everyone uh, adopts to the numbers of the SDG, but it's proven that uh, they work positively. In majority, they work positively on each other. So there are interlinkages between them. Um, there is uh, synergy. Um, and, and that's what I'm looking for, uh, because it's not enough that we have all the goals um, and that um, all parties work on it. It's not only the government, as you know, it's, it's business finance. I, I mentioned to you the whole list. That's already necessary, and I, I can't complain our country. All parties are on board, but the challenging part is uh, the interlinkages, all these topics together. After three years, it's still um, quite difficult how to take decisions, for instance, by CEOs, by ministers, um, working with these 17 goals. Of course, you can focus on three, but please have a look at the others. Otherwise, you make the old mistakes again. We don't have them for nothing, isn't it? Um, so um, I have now great expectations um, of science and research and technology, because when it becomes difficult and it doesn't happen, I believe strongly that you uh, can help us out. Um, both on the content, how can goals um, have synergy on the content, and about the process, that's another discipline. Um, and I, I hope you can work interdisciplinary together, um, which is uh, difficult in itself uh, as well, I know. Um, so um, let's hope if there is any time that f after decades of, of trying to get um, let's say science and knowledge um, working together in programs uh, also through uh, the dis disciplines. Uh, I think the SDGs also give you the opportunity to work together and you can help the SDGs to be achieved. Thank you very much. Hugo, uh, thank you very much and, uh, and yes, you uh, you revealed to us uh, that by its nature, as you start exploring in this arena, uh, you realize that uh, there's huge complexity um, and that the danger is that we find our own SDG we're, we're comfortable with and, uh, and pursue that, um, <laughs> but that is not the, the right approach. Uh, but uh, again, part of the challenge of this network is to both provide the uh, information, uh, the evidence, and maybe the communication that enables those making policy, taking things forward, uh, can make sense 
uh, not so it's simplified to the point that it's meaningful and meaningless, um, but simplified to the point that it's uh, actu actually actionable. So I'm sure that conversation um, will continue with that crucial uh, interface with uh, policy making and, uh, and progress. Um, this is a conversation about a global issue with global partners, and I'm delighted, or even though we are in the, uh, the heartlands of Europe here in Brussels, um, that it's important that we do draw those ideas, that inspiration, and those collaborations from around uh, the globe. Uh, the week before last, I was in uh, Copenhagen, uh, running the circular economy strand of the P4G, Partnerships for Growth Forum in Copenhagen, uh, a real energy trying to uh, build new collaborations. Uh, one of the partners, uh, uh, as part of that conversation, uh, was from uh, Mexico, and ex exciting to see some of the different ideas and thoughts emerging. And I'm delighted that um, uh, this morning, uh, that we are joined by uh, Ambassador uh, Ascanero, Ambassador of Mexico for, to the Kingdom of Belgium, uh, Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and Head of the Mission to the European Union. So as we think about these collaborations, not just locally, but in a, a global context, uh, we're honored to have uh, you with us and interested in some of your perspectives about that collaboration drive taking this agenda forward. Over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, let me start by thanking the Innovation for Sustainable Development Network, as well as the European Parliament, particularly Mr. Gerben Jan Gerbrandi, member of the European Parliament, who have launched this fourth symposium on Innovation for Sustainable Development, together with Future Earth, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the Japan Science and Technology Agency, and the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. I'm honored to represent Mexico here today as co-chair of the United Nations Science, Technology, and Innovation Forum for the Sustainable Development Goals, together with Japan. As you know, we both co-chair the 2018 edition last July in New York, and we will do so for the 2019 edition as well. The inputs of this symposium will be very relevant to feed this multi-stakeholder dialogue, and we hope the broader debates that we are undertaking at the United Nations and other important fora, including the G20. Dear friends, we are probably at the most critical juncture that humankind has ever been called upon to face, as we are confronting for the first time challenges that are truly global and which we can only face together. These global challenges pose not only systemic risks, but even existential risks, such as in the cases of climate change, biodiversity loss, and the deepening of economic and social inequalities. At the same time, opportunities for the development of our full potential are unprecedented, clearly in terms of poverty eradication in its diverse dimensions, health, food security, quality education for all, and even in our ecological footprint, especially due to the tremendous expansion of the global stock of knowledge and technologies. We are not only in the midst of a just a revolution in information technology and artificial intelligence and other machine-related technologies, but we are also learning to manipulate DNA, including, of course, the human genetic makeup. The combination of these trends is posing tremendous opportunities and challenges for our collective well-being. We must recognize that notwithstanding our achievements in terms of research, science, technology, and innovation, there is a mismatch between the immense power that we have now over ecological systems and even on our own bodies and the limited understanding we have of these systems. To be sure, new and rapidly developing technologies, such as artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and robotics, hold incredible promise for the advancement of human welfare, but they also hold the potential to generate negative political, economic, social, and environmental impacts 
including more inequality and more violence. To profit from these amazing opportunities while minimizing risks, we must think not only as technologists, but as total human beings with a broader ethical perspective. We must think about our relationship with ourselves and with our planet, giving due consideration to the fundamental values of equity and sustainability. Also, we need to create a certain kind of global governance that ensures that institutions, norms, policies, and cooperative frameworks by which global challenges are addressed and managed by state and non-state actors are fit to purpose. Thus, changing our mindsets and innovating governance are essential tasks ahead. Technological change should not be only something that happened to us, but we must be able to drive it, to lead it for our collective benefit. We must come to com common understandings on when and how to use our mastery of technologies in support of our shared aspirations as humanity, as envisioned in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Given the scope of these challenges, Mexico has decided to bring the salient issues of rapid technological change to our universal forum, the United Nations Organization. Mexico is convinced that the General Assembly is the ideal space to enhance awareness and reach common understandings and agreements among states and societies at large to ensure that rapid, rapid technological change has a positive impact on the achievement of the SDGs understood as global public goods. To this end, Mexico promoted at the United Nations General Assembly the resolution called Impact of Rapid Technological Change on the Achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, which was adopted in December last year with the co-sponsorship of 35 countries. The objective of this resolution was to provide a sound basis to take advantage of technological advances to accelerate the implementation of the 17 objectives of the 2030 Agenda without limiting or stopping innovation and technological development, but rather fully tapping into the positive potential. Among other elements, through the resolution, the UN General Assembly encouraged UN member states to continue considering the impact of key rapid technological change on the achievement of the SDGs in order to promote greener, more inclusive, and smarter development through international cooperation, better national strategies and public policies, capacity building, and scientific engagement. This resolution also requested the technology facilitation mechanism established at uh, the Addis Ababa Ag Agenda for Action on Financing for Development, including its multi-stakeholder forum on science, technology, and innovation for the SDGs, and its interagency task team on science, technology, and innovation for the SDGs, as well as the Commission on Science and Technology for Development, to, go to give due consideration to the impact of key rapid technological changes on the achievement of the SDGs. To further strengthen last year's resolution, Mexico has presented a new one to the current 73 General Assembly regarding the impact of rapid, rapid technological change on the SDGs and targets. The draft resolution is being supported in general by an enlarged core group of 45 countries, including the European Union. Here I would like to underline our appreciation for the support of the European Union at the United Nations and recognize the valuable contribution made by the European Parliament to the international debate and collective action on these issues, including through such important initiatives as Horizon 2020. We look forward to continue and deepen our collaboration with our European partners in the years ahead. Other actions promoted by Mexico with the same purpose of enhancing awareness and knowledge exchange at the international level was the hosting of two international expert group meetings 
on the impact of rapid technological change and artificial intelligence on the SDGs in 2016 and 2018, which ha have contributed to enrich the ongoing UN debates on these issues. We have also been active at the regional level. In 2017 and 2018, as president of the regional forum of the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean for Sustainable Development, we promoted the exchange of opinions with multiple actors on the opportunities and challenges related to the use of emerging technologies in the region. This was reflected in the report, Data, Algorithms and Policies, the Redefinition of the Digital World, recently presented by the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Furthermore, with the purpose of contributing to multilateral efforts, at our national level, we have worked on a matrix crossing the impact of artificial intelligence on the 169 SDGs targets. Following key challenges that we identified, which might have an important impact, either positive or negative, in different aspects of sustainable development. We have now increased the scope of our matrix to visualize the possible impacts of other main technologies, such as blockchain, nanotechnology, and biotechnology, and, now, and are now disaggregating the data to identify the areas of greatest urgency for action. This coming, coming November 21, we will organize a national gathering of private and public sector, academy, science, civil society, in order to consolidate our matrix, which we believe will be a useful input for the UN Secretary General strategy on new technologies. I wish to underline that Mexico has been especially supportive of the recent launch of the Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation and his strategy on new technologies, geared to promote the use of new technologies in accelerating solutions for the achievement of the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. We are encouraging the Secretary General of the United Nations to keep engaged and building upon actual progress to continue raising the level of ambition to ensure that new, te that new technologies are designed, managed, and used for the benefit of all. Dear friends, to address innovation for sustainable development in a holistic manner, which accounts for all its dimensions in this, uh, uh, the, uh, of this complex challenge and results in actions of relevant impact, we need to include governments, the private sector, <laughs> international organizations, civil society, the technical and academic communities, and other relevant stakeholders. This is why we are fully supportive of the work of the Innovation for Sustainable Development Network and other partners present here today. We are certain that the networking and brainstorming that will take place in this symposium during the next three days will contribute to the collective building of the bridges of understanding and cooperation that we need in order to ensure that innovation and knowledge fully support equitable and sustainable development at global scale. We need to act without delay and at the appropriate scale on these crucial, crucial issues. We look forward to continue working with you in this purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ambassador. And in a world that seems to be slightly intent on um, uh, breaking bridges at the moment, it's really encouraging uh, to see uh, where uh, nations get it and are uh, really involved in that process of, of collaboration uh, and uh, bridge buildings. There's no doubt the challenges are enormous, but uh, collective action uh, and collective conversations are maybe at the heart of seeing that we share a, a huge transformation challenge uh, and an economic opportunity as part of it. So uh, we very much hope and are sure that uh, Mexico will continue to be a, a vibrant player uh, uh, as we take forward uh, some of the uh, ideas and strategies uh, because uh, this has to be uh, a, a global agenda uh, with global partnerships uh, to achieve local solutions. So thank you very much for those encouraging words um, and we hope some of the messages from this conference again will give you a renewed thought um, um, and uh, energy uh, in taking this agenda forward. Um,
it's very important that uh, governments, public policymakers, create frameworks that enable uh, change to take place. Um, but that needs to be a space uh, within which um, uh, entrepreneurs, people with a zeal to deliver change, are able to operate and come up with uh, new ideas, new solutions. Not only do we have insights and understandings about the challenge and opportunity of sustainable development, all of this is happening as uh, uh, a thing called the fourth industrial revolution is just challenging and changing everything everywhere at an extraordinary pace. And we need those people who can make sense of that and turn that into business models and approaches that help uh, take us towards a more sustainable future. Uh, one such person is with us this morning uh, on our uh, opening set of speakers um, and to get a view from the world of business, entrepreneurship, the innovators who are going to be the future, the change makers. Uh, delight, delighted that I uh, joined this morning by Gabriel Gurevich. I won't go through all the companies that you have a finger in, but basically uh, you're a major, not just a thinker around issue of entrepreneurship, innovation and change, uh, but you are a deliverer of change. So uh, we look forward very much to maybe some messages from you about how this community really needs to um, uh, step up its game in support for that uh, change process. Over to you, Gabriel. Thank you very much. Um, as I'm going to be editing my presentation on the fly, I will suggest if I can like, stand there yeah. and do it myself. Thank you. You may have to shout. That's the only thing. No, but I'll, I'll okay, you, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fine. Can you hear me well? <coughs> Amazing. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's an honor for me. And I hope in the next couple of minutes I'll, I'll be able to deliver a message on how actually this sustainable development is going to happen and why technology is so important for it. So with no further, ah, we don't have sound, right? We have sound. We have sound. So raise your hand if you recognize this sound. You know that, right? Okay. First realization, there's no many millennials in this room today, <laughs> as they don't know this song. Uh, this was the dial-up connection we all knew, and it was very popular till 1998 around. But the most important part of this uh, joke is that internet as we know it was created in 1991. The web browser as we know it was invented that year. That's 27 years ago. And you all know how the world has changed, right? We all know what happened in our world. Uh, the only reason I wanted to do this is because probably the next 27 years of development are going to be way more faster, impactful, and no one knows exactly where it's going to take us. But the t besides this, there is a concept called the disruption. And I'm going to explain it with the industry that we all know and pretty much, I believe, Benny of you like it, and this is the Formula One. In 1995, in 1950, sorry, uh, the best team in the pit stop was the Ferrari, okay? And as you can see in this video, it took them something around three minutes to change the wheels, the tires, and put gas on it, and, and do whatever it does in the, in the pit stop. The rest of the teams look at this marvelous and said, oh, this is our benchmark. We need to get there three minutes. And I'm going to comment it a little bit because it's so long. Uh, <laughs> but actually, everybody was looking at the Ferrari team as the best top performer in 1950 for this particular process on an F1 uh, um, uh, how do you say that? Race. Uh, so you can see that uh, the same guy who took away the wheel on the right side then went to the left side and started to do the same. And, you know, this is like a very important process for the Formula One, etc. They clean up the windshield as they had time and eventually it went out. 63 years later, 
and I use this date exactly because this is the world Guinness record not yet being over performed. The same team, the Ferrari, did this. Oh, sorry. Why do I don't have that one? Let's see. No? Sorry, this is because I did it in a Mac presentation and then we, anyway. It happens to be three seconds and 20 milliseconds meaning 24 times better in 63 years. And that's what we call, you know, uh, innovation or, or little steps ahead every year, uh, increasing the performance of the pit stop. So now what I say is that that's not good enough for us. And what we're trying to do now, it's disruption because we don't have time. And what is disruption? Pretty much an interruption of the usual way of system, processes, or events that work. Pointing out a 10 times better performance in whatever you're trying to do. When you talk about innovation these days, and when you're talking about disruption these days, what we're trying to focus is in 10 times. And not over 63 years to improve 24 times. It's like now. What can you do in your process, in your business, in your politics, or whatever, in order to make something 10 times better, faster, cheaper, more sustainable, see? So considering this, you will say it's impossible, but you know what? There's something happening these days with technology. Ray Kurzweil, the dean on Singularity University when I went to school, he said the law of accelerated returns, which is try to think about what technology makes in every field that it's getting contact, which is not lineal, and it's uh, against our common sense of the intuition of things should move 10% each year or something like that. And you start to see that the, the actual uh, Lou, uh, Moore law was only a uh, part of what happened with com computation, that the DNA sequencing cost is dropping dramatically, that uh, the life expectancy for humans is like growing exponentially, that the resolution of MRI is actually getting better every year exponentially, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I can go through data all morning, but I don't have time. The point is, something happened with technology what gets in touch with every field of human <coughs> interest, and even the most aggregated da data of everyone, it's the world GDP per capita, it's actually growing exponentially if you sense it since uh, 1867. So what's gonna happen next? And that's eventually the, the question I will try to answer here with some knowledge. So in 2001, a computer of $1,000 had the potential of processing as a brain of an insect. In 2010, only a decade later, for $1,000, you were able to buy a computer that had the processes of a brain of a rat, right? It's expected by 2023 that the same $1,000 computer will have the potential of a human brain. And before 2050, actually, 2049 is the prediction of Kurzweil, a computer of $1,000 will have the potential, the processing potential of all human brains together. So when I'm talking about disruption, it's something like this. In 50 years, we're moving from the brain of one insect to 9,000 billion, a million uh, brains of humans. Uh, so till now, human history, since we are considered homo sapiens sapiens, has been very linear and local. Uh, hopefully, all of you are not local anymore and very global. Some of you came today from other parts, etc. But what's going to happen in the next at least 150,000 years is that our world is changing to an exponential one. And everything you knew about linear thoughts and linear development is changing rapidly. Let me give you an example that we all know. Probably you still remember this logo, right? Kodak. 1996, the owner of the photography uh, a company with a market cap of $28 billion and 140,000 employees around the world. And you remember for sure 2012 bankruptcy ended, right? 
So this is the rise and fall over more than 100 years of a company who invented an industry. They created the analog photography. And the new Kodak moment, eventually in the exponential world, is this one, Instagram. In April 2000, Instagram was a year old. It had 13 employees and was acquired by Facebook in $1 billion. What they created and offered the world, the ability of all of us to become professional photographers out of two clicks and one filter, is still there, right? But the company created for that actually was not even thought for 100 years. And you can see in this graph that actually photographs, photos taken in the world has only increased exponentially. The analog ones in less than a decade disappeared. So as they said, actually Kodak seems to be the inventor of the digital camera, but they didn't even saw this movement into the digital world, right? And this is what's happening a lot. Uh, it's not your fault that you're not looking at it, Actually, if you read this phrase from the Nobel Prize, uh, Paul Krugman, he said in uh, 1998, by 2005, more or less, people will realize that the economic gr uh, value of internet is nothing greater than the passage. So if he was wrong or he didn't saw it, what can we do as simple humans, right? And besides, uh, behind that is this what we call the, the, the exponentiality it's being impacted in all sectors, some more, some less. If you look at this graph, you'll see that probably you don't want to get involved as an entrepreneur, at least in the media or professional services, which has been already disrupted by these exponential organizations. And you would like to focus on something like agriculture, construction, the lower part of the graph where the more important uh, uh, digitalizations hasn't occurred yet, okay? So how do we get organizations governments, parliaments, uh, companies, and everyone to think in this exponential way. Um, a, good find, a good place to find some information about this is this book, Exponential Organizations, I really recommend you. These days, as far as I understood, every consultant from McKinsey and all those have to read this book before even going to a client. So it's very interesting. Uh, and beside, behind that is this what we call the exonomics, or the economics of the exponential. Uh, there's a lot of information, but being very, very fast is like, when you don't have cost of labor, when you don't need ownership of nothing, when everything is virtual, uh, decentralized, and, and super efficient, what actually is going on on the economics? How do you support a project that won't need much capex uh, investment, etc.? And what happens actually is what you see in that curve there uh, is that the normal distribution it's actually moving. So what we call the black swans, it's happening every time more uh, familiar. And every time you can see them everywhere. So exonomics is one of the fields in economics that actually trying to explain how can we measure, how can we um, uh, understand what's going to happen with a particular project. So let me try to give you some examples of uh, what's going to happen in the future if we consider technology as a main driver for sustainable development. And uh, let me start from here. Probably you know that uh, every time for the rainy season in Africa, there's tons of people that get completely isolated. And there is an issue with medicines and uh, food and etc. So one way to tackle this is to do in Africa what we did already in the developed and in the developing world, which is roads, bridges, etc., and that's trillions, trillions of dollars that sadly Africa don't have them on time, uh, and it will, they will need something like 50 years to catch up. Another way to see how we can solve this huge issue is what some um, uh, students at, univer at Singularity University started to work in 2013 with a technology that wasn't ready yet, which is drones, right? And they said, if we have these drones and we can deliver uh, medicines and food, eventually we don't need to put roads and bridges all over Africa, right? And they started to work. Th that video there, I won't show it, but it's like this bridge gets completely lost on the current that is going up, and they are still able to tra transport the medicine from one place to another. And finally, of course, Amazon Prime bought, acquired this company to use this technology as the base for their delivery over drones, right? Uh, main issue here, at least for entrepreneurs, is if you solve a problem for $1 for a billion people, anyway you become a billionaire, right? 
<laughs> so I met Albina Ruiz Diaz two years ago. She is one of the main leaders in the world working on the social issue that happens where the garbage is stored. Uh, pretty much there is slavery there. There's people trying to catch from the garbage some things that are valuable. Then this guy owns the truck, come here and deliver everything and make the business and keep those people living a very, very uh, unpleasant life, right? And I faced Albina and I said, for the next 10 years, what are you going to be working on? Like make their lives a little bit more um, better or actually change the way we manage garbage. Because actually, as you can see in many parts of the world, the ability to separate garbage and, and do like a very nice job there, uh, efficient, etc., it's with robots, not anymore with people. So I argue with her after three days conversation saying, I love what you do, but the impact what, of what you're doing, it's going to disappear in less than 10 years. So I would prefer to work with robots and push that robots will be used for garbage separation even faster than you expect. Uh, after three days, she said, like, you have a point there. <laughs> and, and then again, things that are going to be happening, this video will show something that's uh, expected to be around for 2025, 2027. So let's say you're in New York and you need to travel to Shanghai for today is a 14 hour trip, right? But uh, because of this technology invented by SpaceX, this company that wants to take uh, humanity to Mars, which is ready, and all of you probably saw the rockets that actually are recyclable and they come back to the point where they started. Uh, this guy said, we need to finance this expedition to Mars. It's too much money for us or any government to do it. So what if people traveling from one place to another in the world, instead of getting to a plane with wings, they get into a rocket and we do a stratospheric uh, trip to the other part of the world, which as you can see in this video actually happens at uh, 27 times faster than a Dreamliner or a commercial plane. As you can see here, the rocket that impulses out of the gravity gets back, it's recyclable, and the cockpit with a max speed of 27,000 kilometers per hour, which is 27 times faster than a, uh, any commercial plane, will arrive in 39 minutes to Shanghai. Yeah. So the guy is gonna get to Shanghai, will do whatever job he needs to do, and that same day he's gonna get back home and sleep with family. So this technology allows to move from one place to another in the world in less than an hour. And it will happen for sure, not for short-term trips, because it's no sense to get all the way out of gravity and back, but for long, like from Chile to Brussels, instead of 23 hours that it took me, it would take me less than an hour. They, this was presented March, March this year, and afterwards, the CEO of Boeing was asked by the press, what do you think about this SpaceX technology that will be around in 10 years from now? And he said exactly what Kodak said, or the Nobel Prize. It won't happen. And he will keep on working on planes with wings when there's no much sense of it, right? So what I'm trying to say, it's. The, the faster we understand the impact on technology for this kind of uh, mindset, the change of mindsets, it's the faster we're going to get to somewhere good. So where are we heading then? Because I haven't said that. Uh, there's people taking, talking about the breakdown, social breakdown, like compared to what happened in the Occupy Wall Street, what happened, in, what's going to happen in 10 years from now, it's going to be disastrous. There's going to be a financial uh, breakdown that's going to be way harder than 2008, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the ones who are more connected with technology, we actually think that technology allows abundance of everything. Whatever you consider scarcity, go to go to technology, and you will convert it into abundance. So I'm going to pass this part very, very fast. The first time I got involved with the circular economy movement and people thinking about sustainability from that way, uh, I actually realized that uh, out of boxes and arrows, everything looks very nice, right? For instance, in Amsterdam, the circular construction chain, but then you start double clicking in everything and you ask things like, okay, you are talking about uh, 
mobile 3D printing facility in order to create just in the spot the, the parts and pieces of whatever you are building. Okay, show me how to do it, which materials you can use, where the technology is, etc. Uh, the same for every part of the separation uh, or uh, upcycling the materials, etc., etc., etc. Or for instance, okay, you're going to have an open platform to sell away materials. Are you going to base it on the blockchain? Are you going to do it with a central unit? How are you going to do it? And I realized that usually sustainable movement, as I usually call it, uh, hasn't made yet double clicking on every box and arrow on their graphs. And this is designed against technology eventually, but I'm here to try to solve this gap and help people to think a little bit more about technology. I'm going to show you now two examples that uh, I believe are very, very mindfulness about this, and, and I'm done. The first one is, probably you know that if we keep on focusing on the meat industry as we know it, uh, chances to feed us all by 2030 are 15% only, okay? We need uh, 1,500 liters of fresh water in order to get one kg of meat out of a cow, uh, compared to 258 liters for one k of potatoes. Uh, and of course, you know, it's the most CO2 emitting compared to even all transport together, uses a third of the uh, land habitable by human beings, uh, is the main consumer of antibiotics and poison, uh, and one of the foremost uh, polluters of air, land, and water worldwide. So this is not very sustainable, right? Uh, and nevertheless inflicts a uh, misery to billion sentient beings. What we can do? Well, in 2013, when I was in university, a burger out of no cow, meaning only cells, costs 330000 uh, uh, $330, and it was a uh, by, uh, acquired by one of the founders of Google, and he ate this burger uh, with a lot of publicity in the UK that year. So you said, okay, this is fancy, but it's not sustainable. Look what happened exactly um, five years after this year, a meatball cost $11, okay? It uses a one-tenth of the water and one hundred of the land versus animal-based meat and it tastes amazing. I tasted these uh, meatballs. Uh, Memphis Meat is one of the companies leading this movement, and what happens is that by 2021, it's estimated the price parity. And here you have another example. This is a Chilean company called Not Company. They are doing out of uh, vegetables, everything related to, to proteins, uh, and what they do is that they have a big data and it, uh, artificial intelligence software that has characterized every uh, food that we eat, and they created this link between how can we make it only based on vegetables. And let me show you another one which is very interesting, and probably you all heard about the third continent, which is this huge amount of plastic that is floating around the place in between uh, Hawaii and Japan, right? Uh, huge. Terribly huge. There's not much to do about that. And then we got this, the solo bag. And I'm going to do it live for you guys. This is a Chilean, actually, entrepreneur. He created these bags, which are exactly the same as you know as the plastic bags, out of a free patent that has more than uh, 50 years out there. The only thing he created was a way to do this product super cheap. And look what happens. I'm going to put it in water, and you'll see magic. This is a soluble bag, that's the name, solo bag, that after getting in contact with water, will get completely dissolved. And not only that, well, it takes a while, but. <laughs> No, but it's actually working with hot water, it's even faster. But the amazing thing, thing of this is that I can actually... <laughs> drink the water. <laughs> There's no harm on it, huh, actually. But uh, again, and they have all sorts of bags. 
this all that I have here, if someone wants to take one, these are all soluble, and they work pretty well, because actually if you're on a, rain, a rainy day, you will be able to get home with your purchases there and, and with the bag still working. So um, this is a 50-year-old patent that the only, only thing that they do really well was, that was actually reformulating it to do it like 100 times cheaper uh, the way the product was. So anyway, um, you don't have to be the so-called more techie kind of Elon Musk guy in order to propose something from technology that will be very sustainable for the world. Um, so it takes five minutes to dissolve this against uh, 500 for a classical bag of plastic. And you will see now, like in a month from now, and this is like a, a, new, a news for you, that uh, companies as uh, Apple, for instance, will start using these bags only. Um, and this is gonna be impacting the world for sure in not a uh, hundred years, I will expect that we all use soluble bags in the next four. Um, and only to finish, you probably know last year, 3.8 billion people in this planet were connected to the internet and as I call it, they existed. Because let's say there's someone not connected to the internet in the other part of the world, my chances to connect with him and do something relevant are no. Right? And what's gonna happen in the next couple of years is that we're gonna get into 100% coverage. There's gonna be 4.2 billion new minds connected to the internet, 4.2 billion new people that actually exist. And this is the only time that's gonna happen. By 2022, 2025 around, this is gonna get there, and then every year it's only the, the small part of new people. So. Four two point billion minds that will create, wish, consume, discover, invent, everything. The best moment for sustainable innovation until now, and it will never repeat again. This is our chance to actually propose solutions, propose uh, everything based on this uh, sustainable state of mind, based on technology, in order to impact this world once and for all. Thank you very much. The next time you see this curve, think about this. Thank you. Gabriel, thank you very much indeed. And I'll, I'll drink to that. You should. Yeah, I will. Come on. Um, so, goodness me, <laughs> uh, the law of accelerated returns um, equals also the law of uh, accelerated consequences. Could be the law of accelerated destruction, the choice in a sense, is ours, but make no mistake, um, transformation and change um, and the power of technology to accelerate um, those sorts of changes is uh, phenomenal. And I suspect we're still only just waking up uh, to those possibilities. Harness that for good, and there are possibilities. Currently, it's harnessed for all sorts of reasons. So our challenge is how we harness that to create a sustainable future. I'm delighted now to introduce someone who's been thinking for many years and operating um, uh, locally and across the globe, trying to understand issues around uh, resource efficiency, innovation, underpinned by research. I'm delighted to welcome to the platform to offer, uh, in a sense from academia, but maybe practical academia, Paul Eakins, uh, Director of uh, University College London Institute of Sustainable Resources, also founding part partner of... Uh, of uh, Inno uh, for uh, SD, member of the U, uh, UN International Resource Panel and co-chair of the GO6 on green economy and green growth. You have a finger in many pies, uh, Paul. Do you come here feeling, aha, we're at a tipping point of hope, possibility, and we're going to make it? Or do you come bearing worrying news for us? Um, I noticed you didn't uh, share the drink. Uh, but, Paul, great to have you with us and very interested to hear your perspective and maybe some of the challenges this uh, gathering needs to respond to. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, and yes, and thank you to Inner4SD and congratulations on everything that you've done. Um, you asked me a question and, and I, I guess I'm going to answer it by saying both. Um, the Global Environment Outlook uh, is the UN Environment's flagship report and will be presented to the world's environment ministers 
uh, at uh, the UN Environment Assembly next March, and it's been my privilege to be a co-chair of that for the last couple of years and work with 150-odd uh, scientists around the world to see what we're doing to the planet. And um, my key takeaway from that is that we'd better be successful in space travel because we're making the planet uninhabitable, right? If we were serious and rational humans, we would be terrified by what we are doing to the planet. But we're not terrified. Most of our populations have absolutely no idea what's going on out there. Um, and it's our job, of course, to try to make them aware of that. And that is where we come to innovation, because by God, we're going to need innovation, either to find a new planet or to stop doing what we're doing to the old one. Next slide, please. The good news is that the tide is turning with regard to perceptions of how innovation comes about. I'm an economist, and I therefore come from a discipline where for many years, especially the Anglo-Saxon brand of economics, innovation is something that markets and entrepreneurs do by themselves, and governments had better keep out of the way. I'm pleased to say that that wrong view of innovation appears in many countries to be coming to an end. In some countries, of course, like Japan, you've never believed in that, and your governments and your industries have worked closely together for many years, and you've in many ways shown the way for that kind of directed innovation. So, away from solely market-driven innovation, towards government business, civil society co-created innovation to address societal grand challenges. And that, of course, is something that market-based innovation cannot and does not do. Market-based innovation is exclusively oriented towards profit. Understandably, that's what businesses are there to achieve. But unless we can harness the power of the market to social challenges, we're not going to get where we need to get. And where we need to get, undoubtedly, as Mr. von Meyerfeld said, is the SDGs. But I can tell you that the other key message coming out of the Global Environment Outlook is that we are not on track to achieve the SDGs, anything like. The key message coming out of the IPCC 1.5 degree report is that 1.5 degrees is more or less for the fairies. Two degrees will be a real, real challenge, and we're currently headed for four or five. So this is kind of the reality of the world in which we live. So by God, we need some innovation. Next slide, please. Just a little anecdote from the UK. The UK, the bastion of many Anglo-Saxon economic ideas, our government finally appears to have woken up to the reality of real-life modern innovation. And we've produced an industrial strategy that's pretty good in many ways, identifies four big societal grand challenges, one of which is clean growth, which is the one that I'm particularly interested in with ideas about productivity. But the most important thing is that quotation I've taken from page 22. Governments in successful economies have recognized their strategic power and leadership role, allowing them to coordinate and convene efforts to develop and disseminate new technologies and industries. And they might also have said new social practices and institutions, because that's just as important a part of innovation in the modern world as the technologies and industries. Next slide, please. I feel a bit embarrassed putting a slide like this on the, um, uh, on the screen in the presence of Professor Rene Kemp back there, who's undoubtedly one of the great um, uh, experts on innovation in the UK and has been part of the NO4SD project, because obviously it's too simple. And uh, Rene has devised many much more complicated and realistic versions of that diagram. But that diagram says two important things. It says that at the early stages of innovation, it's basically a diagram of the innovation chain, that the early stages of innovation, when we're talking about investment 
and when we're talking about the development of new technologies, the public sector has an absolutely crucial role. And in the European context, of course, the Horizon program that's coming up will, to a very large extent, determine whether Europe rises to the innovation challenge that will be so important, not just for the Sustainable Development Goals, but for its entire economic future. And then as these technologies get developed, we get some more market pull, we get more commercial interest, and the private sector comes in and starts to pull through those technologies. If we rely just on the market, then the only technologies we will get will be markets that will make people a lot of money, which is fine. I've got no problem with that to some extent, but that's not what the world currently needs. The market needs to address social challenges, and at the moment, all we've got are governments. Governments are imperfect, but they're all we've got to articulate and pursue the social challenges. Next slide, please. This is a, a really interesting diagram, which you may not be able to read. I certainly find it difficult to read these little screens from here. Uh, thanks to Michal Mijinsky, who's uh, one of my colleagues at UCL and is also very much involved in the Inno4 SD uh, program. And it puts up the, the distinction, really, between fast and slow innovation, the distinction between incremental and disruptive innovation. And my friend Gabriel here was talking a lot about disruptive innovation. We need, really, disruptive innovation, but it has to be innovation with a direction and a purpose. But we should not neglect also incremental innovation, because a lot of incremental innovations over a period of time can lead to a fundamental change in the outlook. And we've got all sorts of things up there um, to do with electromobility, to do with all, so all sorts of other social challenges um, on that uh, distinction between incremental and disruptive and the, uh, the, the way in which they operate in the different parts of the innovation system. Next slide, please. So what um, do we consider when we're thinking about science and technology and innovation policy for the SDGs? which is what this meeting is all about. Well, first of all, we need a systemic understanding of innovation. We're talking about the change in whole systems, and we're talking about the change in whole systems in a particular direction, and that's the direction of the SDGs. In order to achieve the SDGs, we will need societal transformation, and that means a transformation in systems of production in systems of distribution and systems of consumption. And those are going to be pretty fundamental. We've got to be open to a variety of innovation pathways. I'm emphatically not saying that governments are going to pick winners. It would be very nice if governments could pick winners, but we know from experience that they're just as likely to pick losers we're much more likely to pick winners if governments, business, and civil society work together in a co-created, innovating process. We need policy appraisal and evaluation, and all too rarely do policymakers actually evaluate the policies which they put in place. And we need to be prepared to fail. Transformative innovation is risky. I'm going to ask Gabriel when we're offline um, how many failures he's had in his businesses, because we only ever hear about the successes, but any entrepreneur <coughs> I've ever met has always failed as many times as they've succeeded. Politicians and policymakers are not good at taking risks, at being prepared to fail, and I'm afraid that publics are not good in allowing them to do that uh, because uh, they, they find that very embarrassing. Next slide, please. So we need a systemic understanding. We need directionality of policy support. We need a comprehensive and coherent instrument mix that comprises all sorts of different policies. Um, I was very struck at a meeting I was at not so long ago, um, and uh, there was someone who was saying that all sorts of innovations were just going to happen and the examples they mentioned was the Internet of Things and uh, autonomous mobility, so driverless cars and stuff. And I was interested in that perception that they were just going to happen. Because for an economist, what that means to me 
is that the incentives are in place for certain people to do certain things to make them happen. The role of incentives is absolutely critical. And if the only incentives you have in your society are private incentives to make money, then the only innovations you will get are privately based innovations that make people a lot of money. That's kind of the way society works. And both the internet and things and autonomous vehicles are developing very fast because a few rich people and companies think they're going to make a lot of money out of them. If we want to get to the SDGs, we'd better put incentives in place for smart people to move in that direction, because otherwise they won't move in that direction. And that's the job of public policy. So a comprehensive and coherent instrument mix, strategic collaborations and stakeholder alignment. This is a destination we've all got to go to together, or we're not going to get there at all. And by that, I don't mean there won't be any losers. Of course there will be losers. If we're going to decarbonize the economy, which is something that the IPCC says we should do, the guys who currently own a lot of fossil fuels, which are going to have to stay in the ground, they're going to be losers. And somehow society has got to cope with that and make it okay so that we can make that political progress. And we need to learn and we need to experiment, which is something that entrepreneurs teach us all the time. Next slide, please. So finally, we need an enabling environment. That is, that's really what government can provide. And uh, I think it was, again, uh, Mr. von Meyerfeld, who said the crucial importance of having direction, targets, milestones, so that guys who make investments today know that it isn't just for these four years when this government happens to be in office, but that in four years' time it's all going to change and a new government is going to try to take us in a completely different direction. This is something that is for the long term, and we need coherent, stable, consistent government policy that will move in that direction. That's really difficult for politicians. They don't like that. They like getting elected and then bringing out a whole new set of initiatives which they can put their name on and they can cut some ribbons, and that's not going to be, that's absolutely not going to work for the SDGs. There are some good examples of sticky policies, of policies which can be put in place and are then difficult to change. The best example I know of is the UK Climate Change Act, which makes, gives us statutory carbon targets every five years, which is within the political cycle, in order to get towards a substantial CO2 reduction by 2050. Not enough. And we're going to have to revise those targets in the light of the most recent science, the IPCC, and the relevant committee is busy doing that. And then finally, direct support. We've heard about the size of the Horizon program that's coming up, really important. And uh, I've been privileged to work on a number of um, Horizon 2020 projects. And of course, Inno4SD comes out of that. We need to expand that. We need the kind of network that Inno4SD is putting in place. Uh, and we need to work together uh, to make uh, these SDGs happen because at the moment, we're not going to get there and we're not going to get there by a mile. So we better do some innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. And uh, uh, at its heart, a very salutary message uh, that we have to shift uh, our trajectory uh, in uh, disruptive and transformational form at pace. Um, but some clues as to how this movement, this collaboration can be part of informing that change process. So we will see whether the next three days um, helps uh, maybe uh, to provide some further impulse and direction uh, that means that we are part of the solutions uh, that take us uh, towards that sustainable future. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation about some uh, very interesting activity taking place within Japan. I, I was at the uh, co-moderating the World Circular Economy Forum in Yokohama uh, two weeks ago, and extraordinary to see some of the energy, uh, both from business, uh, civil society, uh, academia, and also uh, governments, uh, really trying to grapple with responding uh, 
uh, to the opportunity and challenge of the SDGs. And to draw this particular section uh, to a close, uh, delighted uh, and honoured to, to be joined by uh, Michiharu Nakamura, uh, former president of the ja uh, Japan Science and Technology Agency, and member of the multi-stakeholder group to support the UN technology facilitation me uh, mechanism of the sustainable development goals. And perhaps it is appropriate that we go back to a, a global perspective as we try to uh, search for and seek those uh, effective mechanisms uh, for which uh, innovation becomes the solution towards um, a balanced society on this planet in future. So, honoured to have you with us and interested to hear your comments. Thank you. Thank you, kind of, uh, introduction. My name is Nakamura, and uh, very sorry to be late. Uh, uh, I left Japan 20 hours ago, <laughs> but uh, just arrived in Brussels. Uh, and uh, my talk is, I'm very happy to hear Paul's uh, uh, statement. Uh, my presentation is uh, quite in line with uh, your uh, statement. Uh, three years have uh, already passed uh, since the adoption of the SDGs at the uh, General Assembly of the United Nations. Time flies so fast. Uh, I think the scaling up of uh, science and technology innovation is the most critical agenda for all of us to tackle. So in this uh, regard, what should we do? This is my uh, uh, content of speech. Next, please. SD SDGs are holistic and bottom-up acti activities to attain a sustainable, inclusive development. We have never had such an agenda in human history, it reflects the severe reality such as the climate changes, endless consumption resources, damages in biodiversity, inequality, such and such. Our hope is that STI, science, technology, innovation, contributes to transform society, industry, and human lives to meet the goals by 2030. Next, please. We witness that uh, grand break, uh, breaking innovations occur one another after and transform the society. The example shown here are fundamental and general purpose disruptive innovations, which are followed by divergent innovations and change the society in many dimensions. So we may call these innovations STEM innovations. Among them, Digital innovations are opening a new era. As uh, Ambassador uh, Higuera uh, I just mentioned, a smartphone is not just a phone. It's a tool to connect the real world to cyber world and to whole, whole world to provide a variety of services. So we have technologies, fundamental innovations, combining them with the local needs we can achieve new innovation. Innovation, by definition, is to create new values with a new combination. It's particularly important for inclusive development. The example on the left is a solar kiosk developed by Digital Grid, or WASNA, using solar power and e-money on a smartphone Millions of people in Kenya and the neighboring countries can access to electricity for the first time. The right hand is a mother and a baby, charming, in safe, long-lasting mosquito net called Oyset Net, developed and marketed by Sumitomo Chemicals, which prevents malaria infection. There are plenty of possibilities for STI for SDGs. Key elements necessary are business model, finance, capacity building, and maybe diplomacy. This is a quick reflection of the third SDI forum held in June this year at the headquarters of the United Nations. Sorry, it's very busy. 
new technologies for future innovation is one of the main topics. What the UN, UN agencies and member countries should do to maximize the benefit and minimize the risk is core of the discussion. Exchange of knowledge and practices were encouraged. Implementation of STI for SDG roadmap is also discussed in depth. After the forum, the interagency task team decided to release a guidebook for implementation of STI for SDGs roadmaps. Also, we discussed quite a number of important topics. The summary was reported at the High Level Political Forum, by the way, by co chairs Ambassador Hoshino and Ambassador Salvatore Mediore. The United Nations Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, organized interagency task team to facilitate STI for SDGs in the world, where more than 30 agencies are involved. Also, 10 people just introduced are nominated every two years to support the ATT activities. These are present members of the 10 member group. SDGs are bottom up activities toward 2030. Not only a government, but industry, academia, NPOs, and citizens are engaged to transform our society by their own views. However, we think that we may better coordinate such diverse activities so that we can secure the achievement of the whole world. To do so, government has key roles. It is important to establish a national development plan which has STI strategies as integral elements. It is possible by cross collaboration with the science community, business sector, and society. The United Nations also has a number of agencies to support it. At the STI Forum in 2016 and 2017, it was agreed that STI roadmaps and action plans are needed at the sub-national, sub national, and international levels, and should include measures for tracking. STI for SDG roadmaps have also been discussed repeatedly in 2017 Incheon Workshop on STI for SDGs, Expert Group Meeting in Tokyo, and the STI Forum 2020. 18 this year. This year, the United Nations IITT launched a working group on this top, uh, topic. The sub working group is preparing, as I just mentioned, a good guideline or, or a guidebook for roadmaps, and it will be discussed at the next expert group meeting held here in Brussels in November 27 through 30. So today, tomorrow's discussion will be a very important input to the next expert group meeting. Okay. STI for SDGs implementation process includes foresight, horizon scanning, synergy, trade-off analysis, such as done by EASA or X and X. Then we identify target domains and missions followed by gap analysis, co-design, collaborative actions, monitoring and reviewing, and restart a new cycle. It is a dynamic circular process, such as STI process will be touched in the coming roadmap guidebook delivered by the United Nations. Since the 17 goals, next please. Since the 17 goals and 100, 69 targets are interlinked and have synergy trade-off between them. X, now called EISC, has been analyzing them for food, health, energy, ocean in detail. For example, an increase in agricultural production to help end hunger can result in an increase in water use, which may compete with water demand. demand or achieving universal access 
to drinking water. Similar analysis has been done at country level by IGES, Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. EASA has shown pathways toward goals and identified major domains to tackle. So well, this is a, an example of a theme or goal-oriented SDI for SDG roadmap frame, uh, scheme. Since we are intent to, intending to implement STI as innovation in society, not on te technological pathways, but also economic and social elements should be incorporated. This includes feasibility demonstration, business model, investment, law and rules, standardization, infrastructure, and social acceptance. In the technological dimension, database and capacity building are highlighted in the digital uh, revolutions. In Japan, uh, let me uh, turn to the, introduce uh, you the SDG activity in Japan. In Japan, the SDG promotion headquarters was established in 2016, which is headed by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and composed of all ministers in order to ensure whole of government approach to implementing 2030 agenda in a comprehensive and effective manner. It adopted SDG's implementation uh, guiding principle and also uh, this year it decided SDG's action plan 2018 with three pillars, promotion of society 5.0 linked with SDGs, regional revitalization, revitalization by SDGs, empowerment of next generation and women as main, main players of SDGs. Society 5.0 is a Japan's vision for sustainable development launched in 2015. It aims at human-centered society, leveraging fusion of the physical world and the cyberspace by advanced ICT. Since data plays a dominant role, it may be called a data-driven society, which provides new values and services, meeting diverse needs and aspirations for sustainable development. A variety of new systems and services which will correspond to SDGs are realized and supported by data science and its utilization, or science, technology, and social function and capacity building. So let me skip this. Next, please. We have been discussing uh, with Japanese government on national roadmaps for STI for SDGs. This is a tentative principle for STI for SDG roadmaps uh, describing the role of the government for developing roadmaps. It says many things, 1.3456, say, uh, making correlation between the national STI roadmaps, plans, strategies. They have many, many tools and uh, uh, publications, but they are not well in, in, uh, correlated. So number one is a better correlation, such and such. I noticed that uh, their uh, principle, in the principle, the number uh, f five, uh, five, creating an environment where multi st stakeholders can dialogue, co-design, co-creation as the SDI for SDGs platform, they're going to build a national platform uh, by their leadership. That's, I think it's very, very important. Next, please. Uh, based on the first side, horizon scanning, linkage analysis, and consultation with multi-stakeholders, we pick up uh, strategic domains for roadmap implementation at national and subnational levels. These are some representative domains. Among them, of course, uh, countermeasures for severe climate uh, changes and rapidly aging should be of highest priority in Japan. We need to share sense of crisis. We need to share clear vision and long-term commitment of multi stakeholders, particularly industry. We need to share 
this kind of roadmaps for coordinating multi-stakeholders activity coherently and tracking progress. So uh, this is a Japanese uh, version of STI for SDG roadmap for uh, transportation, the aut autonomous uh, driving system are included in, in this example, just an example. Another deep population and aging pressure and rapid centralization to mega cities such as Tokyo and Osaka, revitalization of lo local region is another important agenda of 2018 SDG action plans. Japanese government has selected 30 strategic regions to support uh, regional innovation and meet SDGs in their uh, context. Uh, this is an example of Kita Kyushu city. It just mentioned uh, another important uh, point. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to mention uh, some activity by Keidanden, Japan Business Federation. They have just uh, revised their chart of corporate behavior last year and is pushing SDGs related initiatives under strong leadership of new chairman, Mr. Hiroaki Nakanishi. It's very important the business sector go ahead of all of, all of us, government, citizens, academia are following industry. This is uh, the situation we have in Japan. It's very happy to see that. Next, please. I don't have uh, much time uh, to mention the international agenda. Uh, we have uh, some discussion with uh, the United Nations IATT. Uh, so they're going to have a guideline or guidebook including both uh, national level roadmap implementation and international level, international level roadmap implementation. So they are coming together. But uh, uh, in reality, we cannot pursue both at the same time. So at least in Japan, we go first for national uh, level roadmaps. Then we move to the international roadmap very soon. It's our uh, domestic discussion. So in summary, I mentioned uh, some key issues to scaling up STI for SDGs. And I emphasize that uh, government leadership is very important. And also industry, academia, citizen, every, everyone uh, working together with the government. It's uh, what we are passing in Japan. Thank you. Mr. Nakamura, we thank you very much uh, indeed uh, for that presentation, uh, both uh, looking from a UN perspective, but also particularly looking at uh, uh, some of the activities that are taking place uh, within the Japanese uh, context and another major global player uh, that is seeking to get and embrace the sustainable development goals. So ladies and gentlemen, you have heard a number of uh, interventions this morning. Um, we hope that you have, uh, that's a sound for 2018, that is, yes. Um, we hope we'll be interested to know the sound for 2028. Perhaps it will be the sound of silence. Um, you've seen that there are um, important enabling frameworks, uh, at European level, national government level, um, uh, uh, that are creating a playing field within which the possibility of innovation for sustainability can take place. You've seen uh, the extraordinary uh, potency and pace of change that innovation in a fourth industrial revolution is going to um, offer us or challenge us with. And you've heard salutary messages that at the moment we are off pace and risk exponentially getting further off pace. We hope that this is all important feedstock for the discussions uh, over the next uh, three days about how this network is part of enabling serious uh, disruptive transformation towards uh, really getting the issues 
and then focusing and channeling innovation in directions that support uh, societal goals expressed through the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, so on your behalf, I'd like to thank very much our speakers in this first session for maybe setting the frame, the challenge, and offering us uh, some solutions. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, what I'd like to do is to say after the break, we're going to just... Uh, have uh, some fresh faces from different uh, key organisations and we're going to open up a little bit of discussion framing maybe some of those agenda items we need to explore uh, in uh, more detail. Uh, but for now, um, we're going to just take a short uh, break about uh, probably through till uh, 12.30. Uh, we have one disruptive innovation in that apparently there is no uh, coffee available in the coffee break. Um, we're going to see how that disruptive innovation actually works for us. Uh, you have two alternatives. Um, there is some soluble water for you to nourish you. Uh, and you may also, uh, part of the challenge we face is about communication. In this bubble, we get it. We're sort of doing stuff. The world out there needs to hear the messages. So don't forget hashtag in of 4 sd and maybe a selfie with a perfectly pure glass of water may be offering a solution for the future. Have a think about that, because communication is a key. But as I say, uh, take a break, uh, maybe wander outside for a few moments, and we'll be back at 11.30 to continue this uh, first set of discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to say, if you're on the panel after the break, um, it would be good just to have a short conversation with you now, just in this corner here. So if you're on the panel after the break, it would be good just to have a, a brief word with you.
If we could uh, uh, take our seats, please, that would be great. Okay, if we could take our seats, please. They're probably just waiting for one or two people who couldn't contemplate a break without coffee. <laughs> They're now on their third lift down to the basement. Okay, so welcome back, and if uh, we could take our seats, that would be great, please. So, uh, over the next uh, hour, um, I'm privileged to have uh, on the platform here uh, some people representing very interesting uh, organizations, networks uh, that are part of that uh, innovation for sustainable development journey. In the first uh, part of our conversation, we were um, uh, looking at a very strategic level uh, and beginning to soften up some of the uh, issues, many of which are, I'm sure, familiar to us. During this uh, conversation, uh, we'll see where it takes us, but I'm uh, uh, keen to see whether we begin to draw some uh, thoughts and coherence about those pathways by which uh, uh, networks engaged in uh, the research and innovation agenda related to sustainable development, and particularly those um, uh, framing their operations and activities within the uh, sustainable development goals, to have perspectives from some of those networks on this issue and then maybe to open up and draw together um, uh, some uh, key thoughts, some key messages which we hope will um, infect and inspire productive conversations uh, through the next uh, two and a half days. And particularly on Friday afternoon we're going to be really looking about, okay, are we fit for purpose for what is required or are there new uh, uh, energies or reinforcing messages or whatever that we need to put together. So um, thank you very much uh, to my panel uh, for agreeing to join us. And I'll just uh, quickly go along uh, and introduce, uh, no, I'm actually going to do them one at a time, otherwise I'll spend all the time doing introductions. And I'm going to give each of you 
Um, just four or five minutes, there's a clock up there, uh, so we do have some discussions. Just maybe to offer your perspective from, uh, maybe uh, tell us a little bit about your network world, but then also what's um, inspiring, worrying, or encouraging you to think about that collaboration uh, for research and innovation towards sustainability. So I'm going to start uh, to your left, my right. Delighted we're joined by Angelo Riccoboni. A uh, member of the Leadership Council at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, also ch uh, chair of the uh, SDSN Assembly, and also chair of the Prima Foundation, which is a partnership very much looking at um, uh, building research and innovation capacity around the Mediterranean uh, society. So, uh, Angelo, uh, maybe a little bit more about the world from which you're coming, and maybe some key thoughts to seed into our, into our conversations at this conference. Thank you, Peter. Just a few words about uh, SDSN, which is a, a global network led by Jeffrey Sachs under the auspices of the Secretary General of the UN. It was founded in uh, 2012, and the vision of Jeffrey Sachs is very clear. We need uh, innovation, we need uh, uh, research, we need universities to implement Agenda 2030. I was very lucky to be at the adoption of the SDGs, and the issue immediately after was how to execute the agenda, and the agenda is not easy to, to implement. So we are 800 universities and research centers around the world, and there are 30 national and regional networks. I'm very pleased to chair the network for the Mediterranean. And the issue here basically is how to mobilize universities and research centers to implement such an ambitious agenda. And uh, uh, Peter asked us to, to be concrete and to make reference to uh, solutions because we need to share and scale up solutions. Two thoughts. First, uh, I think that technological innovation is very important, but we shouldn't overlook social and organizational innovation, because uh, even the examples we saw about meat and plastics, the success of the solutions that were presented, and they will come later, definitely, depends upon the fact that socially, plastics, for instance, has become a key issue. We promoted a, a, an initiative called Plastic Busters five years ago, and at the beginning, it was very difficult to go ahead. In the last few months, there's a, a lot of interest in all the projects related to plastics, because plastic is getting our guts. And it's really something that is uh, hitting everybody. And because of the consumers, because of the citizens' reactions, then the commission has issued, the EU has issued a, a regulation on it. I mean, the social dimension of everything is so important that we do not, we shouldn't overlook this part. And related to the social dimension is the other point, and the role of, 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 of uh, universities for it is education. Education is extremely important, and we as SDSN, we have prepared and launched 15 massive open online courses, MOOCs, at a very high level of quality, because we do believe that education is a paramount if we want to implement Agenda 2030. So, the point is that without looking at this social part, it's very, very difficult. Consumers, we have mentioned consumers, but I think that in order to implement the agenda, it's very important to see how the consumer can ask better products or products prepare with more attention to uh, our health and our environment. And I give you the case of uh, what is happening in the food sector I'm deeply involved in the food sector. Uh, everybody knows that on uh, September 27, a high-level panel of a uh, head of uh, states and government met in uh, New York, and they launched a process related to not communicable, communicable diseases, saying that all the sector should decrease the use of fat, sugar, and uh, all of this is becoming opportunities for companies. So the third thought I'm presenting is we need to promote sustainable consumption because companies, I'm professor of management, I can tell you that is completely true, 
companies start feeling the importance of new opportunities coming from uh, sustainable consumption, and also in order to deal with the risks, reputational and operational risks, companies are more and more keen on it. So this is an opportunity that we should play. Thank you very much uh, indeed, and I certainly want to come back um, uh, on some of those points as we open up the conversation, but uh, thank you for lobbing uh, those thoughts uh, uh, into the pond to start us uh, off. I'm going to hear from all our, our panellists before I develop the conversation for, uh, further. So uh, next, uh, Benjamin Simmons, great to have you with us, Head of the Secretariat, Secretariat of the Green Growth Knowledge Platform. Maybe a few more words about that platform and how you're seeing uh, that connecting in to some of the issues that we are talking about in responding to the Sustainable Development Goals. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Peter, and thank you to the Innovation for Sustainable Development Network. Uh, for inviting us to be part of this discussion. Um, I, I actually think this is a fantastic panel um, in the sense that it does bring together a number of different networks, um, all trying to influence and, and contribute to collaboration within their, uh, within their constituency. Um, I think one of the challenges we hope that we can address through this panel, but through the next few days, is how do we actually start collaborating as networks? That's a much more difficult um, um, request. The, um, the Green Growth Knowledge uh, Platform um, is, uh, for those of you who, who don't know it, uh, or have never heard of it, it's, uh, it was uh, incubated in the World Bank um, just before Rio Plus 20. And in very early days, uh, the World Bank reached out to a number of other uh, leading intergovernmental organizations that were preparing uh, major pieces of analysis in the lead up to Rio Plus 20, um, but that also were engaging directly with government ministries. Um, and so they initially reached out to the OECD, who at the time was preparing a major green growth report and was creating some metrics around green growth uh, to a UN environment, which was called UNEP at the time, um, and then also to the Global Green Growth Institute, um, which was Korea-based, um, not yet an intergovernmental organization, which it is now, but, but rather a think tank on, on the road to becoming an intergovernmental organization. And the, the reason the uh, World Bank initially reached out to these other partners to, to launch this initiative um, was there was a, a recognition that each of the institutions was developing really important pieces of work, but they were developing those pieces of work in relative isolation. And that as a result, some of the advice that was pr being provided to various ministries, whether they were ministries of environment through UN environment or ministries of development from the bank, or ministries of economy from the OECD, they were sometimes receiving um, not exactly the same piece of advice, right? That there was some, um, um, there was some conflicting messages at times. And wouldn't it be a good idea to start trying to meet together, work together, and, and start to understand each other's perspectives and then offer something of more value uh, to the governments? Um, and so these uh, organizations worked together in the lead up to Rio Plus 20 and then felt that it was such a good experience they would try to create this broader network around the topic of green growth, um, which uh, there's some debate about what that means, but at least for, for our purposes, it's really that intersection between economic development and environmental uh, sustainability. Um, and then uh, to see if that network could also be broadened. So today, um, after the four founding partners, we're now a, a network of 60. Uh, institutions, which includes most of the UN agencies that are focused on economic development or environmental sustainability. So that includes the economic commissions, but also many of the regional uh, development banks, and most importantly, also a number of the think tanks and research institutes around the world. Um, in order to try to collaborate and address some of the tricky questions um, that we have when it comes to economic development and environmental sustainability uh, in, a, in a much more collaborative, collaborative fashion. Um, one of the issues I hope we could uh, perhaps tease out a little bit on this panel today is, is you know, what makes for a good um, collaboration and a good network um, and successful. I mean, one of the major challenges we had initially in setting up the network um, was really trying to have the institutions, originally the four, but other institutions now, to redefine their personal agendas into a common collective agenda to address an issue. This is an extraordinarily difficult task but one that is definitely worth it if you are able to succeed in that effort, you're able to then obviously multiply and scale 
at a, at a rate um, that would otherwise be very difficult um, from, from one organization. Uh, you asked um, what's inspiring to us, what's encouraging, and what's worrying. Uh, certainly, I, I find personally uh, the question around innovation um, extremely uh, inspiring. Um, just the enthusiasm of those that are engaged in it, the startups, um, uh, the fact that you have so many younger people that are engaged in some of these tough questions. Um, uh, encouraging, I think there's at least what I have seen over the last um, five years since I've been involved in this particular network. Um, that there is more interest in collaboration than ever. I think the one thing the SDGs has really done is I think it's drawn everyone's attention to the importance and complexity of the challenges that we're facing. And I think there's now an understanding that these challenges will not be, will not be addressed by any single institution. And so I think that's very encouraging. I would say worryingly um, is, uh, is, is probably the fact that, that many colleagues working on some of the social economic challenges um, may not be, I think there's a, there's a challenge around ambition. Um, and if you start to look at this, uh, this rocket that's going to take someone from New York to Singapore um, in 30 minutes, where is our 30 minute rocket in the socioeconomic challenge space? Where is our rocket to actually address these issues at that level and scale and speed? So I'm a little discouraged by some of the ambition, um, um, I, which I'm not sure, we should have said worrying at the beginning perhaps, that's a, that's a negative note to, uh, um, to, to end on, but uh, that's what I would see as, as a worrying factor. Great, thank you very much, uh, and certainly we'll come back to this, uh, uh, this um, uh, building collaborations effectively so that the messages are clear, and uh, we'll come back to that uh, question. Um, next, uh, Wendy, Wendy Broadgate, a Global Hub Director, Sweden, a member of the executive team of Future Earth, very much a, a research uh, initiative of, uh, around uh, environmental uh, and uh, sustainable development, understanding what's going on and sharing messages related to that. Again, interested, you're a very interesting network self of, uh, uh, of uh, scientists looking at things. Very interesting in your uh, take on uh, where we're at. You're probably very well versed in what we need to be worried about, um, but also maybe one or two takes on our, our collaborative journey forwards. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah. Well, that was a, a nice introduction to what Future Earth is. We're a research and innovation network for global sustainability. Both um, hard science, but also social science is really important to our mission. We, we also want, through our work, to actually um, to catalyze the transformation to sustainability. So not be observers and fact providers in this, but actually insert our science into um, social change. And, and I think... Um, the, the co-design of science questions, the co-design of science is a really important part of that because that creates um, both a collaboration with um, stakeholders, entrepreneurs, policy, but also a, a deeper understanding of the urgency and the facts. So I, I think this um, collaboration is, is fundamental in both inspiring and delivering towards um, sustainable development. Um, one of the, the aspects that I wanted to take a deeper dive into today um, in the innovations realm is the, the recent roadmap for exponential action on climate change that we um, published in September at the Global Climate Action Summit. And that is um, really a, um, if, we, if we look at the IPCC, the recent IPCC report, it really maps out the urgency of our need to act now. Um, you know, the time that we're in, we're in the last hour of when we should be acting on climate change. And our roadmap is, is mapping out by sector globally how, um, what we need to do in the next 10 years to help entrepreneurs, to help businesses, to help um, the policy community actually see the, the road in front of us, the immediate steps that need to be taken. So um, the recent science shows that the, the global carbon law um, needs to be followed to meet the Paris Agreement. And I was delighted uh, about Gabriel's presentation earlier where he described very clearly 
um, the need for exponential change, but also the, the, the possibilities, the real possibilities. Exponential change has been happening in the, the tech industry for forever. Moore's law um, to half the, the speed of chips, half the, double the speed of chips, half their size, double their capacity, half their cost. Every two years has been the, the, the goal of Intel since, you know, and the tech world since the 1960s. So this is normal for, for the tech world. And our roadmap has been mapped out in collaboration with um, some leaders in the tech industry, with Ericsson, with Telia, and um, I'm working also with Mission 2020 and um, WWF to really look at how we can um, push this information out into the world to, to inspire um, change. So the to half emissions every decade in, in various sectors, industry, transport, buildings, food, agriculture. We've mapped out that it is possible with existing technologies. The, the, the key factors are actually um, policy leadership and their behavioral change. Um, and the, the tech world can really help us. The, the fourth industrial revolution is, is upon us. Um, AI, um, uh, Internet of Things, uh, digital economy, circular economy, how we use our mobile devices. These are all both um, providing technological solutions, but also um, behavioral change. I mean, the, the companies that are driving these forward um, are actually changing our behaviors. I mean, we've all got a smartphone in our pocket, and what that provides us with has really changed our um, behavior, all of us, even the oldies. Um, since, the, the, since the iPhone was produced in, in 2007. So we're, we're very much, um, this roadmap is really designed to inspire, um, to, to sort of set a compass point for those um, entrepreneurs towards sustainability, towards um, decarbonization, and offer a, a roadmap of specifics of how to do that. So I, I'd like to tease out some of that in the, in, as we go forward. Um, what I find inspiring, I'm also inspired by the, the young entrepreneurs that are actually producing a lot of these solutions. Um, I'm encouraged by the movement building in society that's really helping our policy leaders actually be able to make change. I think that movement building is, is really critical. And I'm, I'm very worried about um, the urgency that we have no time to waste. We have to peak emissions by 2020 and halve them by 2030. That is an enormous challenge and the ambition is not high enough today, but we have the solutions already on the table to do that if we have the, the policy framework and the behavioral change to implement it. Thank you very much. Uh, adding and reinforcing some of the agendas for, uh, for discussion. Um, so uh, uh, I like some of the linkages already. Uh, Wolfgang, I'm going to come to you next. Wolfgang uh, uh, Teubner, Regional Director of Europe of ICLE. Uh, the local governments for sustain sustainability. You have fingers right across the world in municipalities, in cities, cities that space of change for good, evil or whatever, but goodness me, they are the spaces where we will probably ultimately decide whether we hit sustainability or not. An extraordinary uh, network of activity. Um, very interested to hear one or two of your thoughts about that uh, collaboration journey and also your hopes and fears. Thank you, Peter. Yes, I mean, uh, as Peter already said, I, I think our whole history as an organization is basically totally linked to the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda for um, almost 30 years now. The, the question is, and I think what we try and see is that, that the idea is, of course, to see cities as kind of a laboratory for development, for partnerships, to co-create, co-develop, and of course work uh, uh, across the, the area of different stakeholders. Of course, what we face is also the fact that, of course, cities are not uh, lawmaking bodies, and of course they have, uh, depending on systems, uh, limited influence, I would say, on, on, on the frameworks they have to operate in, which is uh, a bit of a challenge in itself, because I, I strongly believe that uh, ultimately 
also with the help of technology, we can also decentralize a lot of processes and customize a lot of solutions uh, to local circumstances in, in, in the world. I mean, if I, if I would say of challenges or anal analysis, I mean, I think I would, I would maybe start if we, if we look at the SDGs and uh, we look at the, the basic idea behind it, because the basic idea behind the SDGs at least historically, is that we have a limited ecosystem and that we basically have a limited, uh, that we have boundaries that we have to respect. If you look at the SDGs, of course, well, there are 17 goals which are contradictory in themselves. And, and the question is that we still loom around the question of priority setting and which is more important than the other potentially and, and how, how they trade off between, between each other. If we look at innovation, I think also, I mean, in this discussion, we are facing, you know, focusing 80% on technological innovation, but we forget cultural innovation. When we talk social, we often mean cultural, because if we talk about behavior, we talk about cultural legacies, we talk about heritage, we talk about customs. And I think that is, that is an important part that we often forget, and we infuse, you know, the technological innovation in a, in a system that is fundamentally, potentially working on different or wrong principle and is guiding us in the wrong direction. And, uh, and I think that that is, that is a challenge also that we, that we have to see. And we, we say, I mean, we have this nice sentence, leave no, no one behind. I mean, just to go back on this rocket example, I mean, how many, what is the percentage of people that will use these rockets? So, you know, we see already now in our societies the divide, the, also the cultural divide with, you know, people that profit from globalized developments and people who feel at least that they that they're not, not profit besides using Facebook and everything. If you look also at the fact that, you know, the scale that we get through innovation in terms of, uh, you know, internet and everything and speed, I mean, you know, we accelerate intelligence as much as we accelerate stupidity and I think we have learned that in the past few years if we need, when you look at what is happening in our in our systems as well, so we have to think about that uh, in the same way. Then we see the the issue that we have an economic system that is fueled by an artificial resource that we can basically, uh, you know, have more and more. I mean, we create money which is infused in the system, which creates demands and everything, which which ultimately, of course, puts pressures on resources and we have not had, I would say, a, a severe economic innovation in the system for a hundred years. I mean, we still are going back to, you know, the early days of industrial and mass production, you know, and our economic models are ruled by the same, you know, Keynes and a bit of neoliberalism as kind of alternatives, but we have no, no new idea that is reflecting the, uh, the uh, you know, the resource limits that we have. I mean, we produce more and more money, but we cannot produce more and more natural resources. And finally, if we talk about social innovation, I think ultimately if you have limited resources, you know, we try to get around the, the distribution question. This is ultimately, it's a, it's a question of distribution. It's not only money, it's resources, because resources mean opportunities and, and, and chances. And if you look at all the statistics also relating to, to SDGs, you see that we have not managed to say we have solved, you know, all the gender, the poverty and everything in, without basically destroying the environment because all those that are doing good in, in, you know, they have all these nice things in place, education, everything, they're still the ones that overconsume and destroy the climate. So I think, you know, we have a lot of issues to discuss and change here. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much indeed, and, and in a sense the focus of our uh, conversation over these next three days is, is have we got the, the mechanisms that are most fit for purpose to ask more questions if they need to be asked, uh, but to find some clear uh, and resounding uh, answers that get into the right ears. Um, finally, I'm uh, going to come along uh, to the far end of the panel, uh, Marinka uh, Vanguard, who's uh, Managing Director of Circular Economy and the Environment at uh, TNO. Um, uh, Netherlands-based independent research uh, organization, very much involved in the INOV for uh, SD uh, program. Uh, fascinated to hear your take on what you've heard and maybe your own uh, take on, on the co collaboration agenda moving forwards. Okay, um, I have a little problem with my ah. microphone. Ah, now it's working. Oh you, oh, you need to close it, that's fine. Okay, uh, I hope you're here. 
Hear me now. Um, maybe just a short introduction of like TNO. TNO is an RTO, which means that we're not like a university, but that we apply science or apply research and technology uh, to uh, the environment and to the society, uh, which uh, uh, is sometimes uh, lacking. And what we aim for is that we get our innovations and also that the society innovates better and accelerate it. So um, uh, we, are, we, are, we have a success if like society takes it over and really implements it. That, that's basically what we are accelerating and heading for. Um, we do that on societal challenges mainly and um, I'm uh, heading the unit uh, circular economy and environment. Uh, which uh, recently has been established. We do a long time already in TNO uh, work about this, uh, like for example, the analysis on scarce uh, materials, for example, which has been long ago uh, there. But we're now also uh, uh, creating or refocusing again on this topic, uh, which I think is uh, yeah, very, very, very good to do. What in my unit has been done is that on the one part is the circular economy part and the other part is environment and climate. Uh, on the circular part, uh, we have like kind of economic combined with uh, environmental impact models. And what these models do is that they help governance or uh, governments or uh, industries uh, to say what solutions do create, for example, uh, money, uh, uh, jobs, uh, uh, environmental uh, footprint, but also CO2 reductions. Because like we believe that if those four are in place, then also change will happen. And um, it's like about a compass which where you should start. And uh, maybe also there uh, to already elaborate a little bit on the discussions before. I believe in this change also for the circular part, if that uh, it's not only technological, but it needs also to be technological because there are still some things we cannot do now. Eh? For example, complex plastics, we cannot uh, uh, degrade or, or reuse, like reuse we can, but uh, uh, recycle, for example. On the social part, uh, already uh, 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 suppressed here. Uh, but also on the economic part. And um, I, I really want to establish that also. And I was very glad that Professor Elkin was also mentioning that, like the economic part of things, because I, I think without those economics, we cannot make it happen that fast. And um, um, uh, for example, those models, maybe to give a short example, is that uh, in the Netherlands, we have like for circular economy, the transition agendas. Uh, which like focus on five domains and uh, give like uh, roadmaps in what we should do until 2050 to uh, really get to an, uh, a circular economy. And what we, for example, did is we calculate all those actions and um, calculated that if we would implement that, that uh, what contributes to uh, the uh, Paris Climate Agreement also on CO2 reduction substantially. So we calculated that one fourth of like uh, uh, the Paris Agreement we could achieve also by circular economy, which, which is used. Uh, of course, then also there needs to be a lobby because like the Paris uh, Act, they, they, they think about the, 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 the chimneys and which is what is coming out of the chimneys. This is to prevent that it comes out of the chimneys. And so also there uh, things could happen. On the other hand, in circular economy, we focus on the value chains. So also social, economic and uh, technology. Um, uh, also to keep products longer in the cycle. Uh, so maybe the example of the bag, maybe we don't need bags. So why should we focus on those? Um, um, and also the endurance in those cycles, and we focus on the more difficult, disruptive technological solutions. For example, in uh, chemical recycling of very complex plastics. And um, uh, because we uh, think that uh, without, like us, being really also pushing that through, it stays in the valley of death and is not coming out. And that's like the, the, the thing which, which we do at that moment. Um, maybe just to tell a little bit shortly about uh, the climate, for example, in cities, uh, we also have like uh, models which forecast uh, the dust or the CO2 or the NO2 or anything else. 
uh, uh, in the city. We have it now also, it's open software, so you can see it on our website, and you can also see what we forecast where it comes from. So is it from agriculture, is it from uh, the mobility sector, is it from anywhere else? And that's also basically uh, I, our contribution there. Um, maybe to say uh, which I uh, really like and really um, appreciate is that I see that the discussion on circular economy and on climate is getting uh, again there. Also like in industry, I'm also like we have the climate tables in the Netherlands. I'm a part of the expert team of the industry climate table and I see that it's becoming a really hot or a more important topic. And that's Actually, recently, that's not that long already, and um, because uh, and that's also because I think that some of the plastic producers they still want to have double-digit growth in plastics, and I d I don't think that has changed so far, but at least they're now also thinking about the social impression and the uh, uh, and disturbance they take away. So it's also from their marketing part that they also consider it as an important issue. And it doesn't matter to me where it comes from, but if we can help also these kind of things to make it more sustainable, that, that would uh, really help. Great. Thank you very much. There's quite an agenda. Um, I want to focus uh, in a moment, uh, particularly around this, this collaboration agenda. And, and, and what I'm hearing loud and clear is that um, uh, if we want um, innovation to move in the right direction, we have to create the, uh, in a sense, the framework for that, not yeah. just leave it to the market. And I want to come back to that in a moment. I just want to touch something on you, something you've said, first of all, Angelo. And you were talking about, in a sense, the role of education and the role of, role of universities. And just a, just a short conversation in case someone has another insight. But um, I'm just quite interested. I was struck. I was running a, a, a conference on the chemicals, global chemicals industries, uh, with the uh, 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 United Nations Environment Program and um, the ICCA. Um, and there was a guy called John Warner who said, part of the problem we've got at the moment is our education system is still pumping out um, uh, one-trick specialists. So in the chemicals world, we've got the most amazing chemists who know everything you can do with molecules and all the rest of it, but don't get it in any sort of a context. And he was really, um, in, this was in China, he was dramatically angry, <laughs> saying, saying our, in, our education system, you know, in every institution there's a wonderful center for sustainability, um, which is a little oasis surrounded by silo specialists who don't seem to be getting uh, their contribution to a bigger picture. I just wonder whether anyone just briefly wanted to, con uh, to, to comment on whether one of the targets around um, uh, in of force SD needs to be around thinking of uh, retooling that core education system as part of that journey towards encouraging innovation, effective research, etc. Does anyone want to just comment uh, on that? Yeah, Wendy. Yeah, no, that, that's something that we at uh, Future Earth really feel is hindering our progress, is the, the sectored approach, the siloed approach in, in education, but also in policy, in in many areas, the, the reality is, you know, every decision requires in integrated analysis from across different sectors, and and actually our education system doesn't encourage that. So um, we're really um, promoting sustainability science as a field um, in itself, uh, as as valuable as mathematics or physics, and um, want to see, you know, rather rapidly more institutions, more departments, more. Um, integrated courses in sustainability, but also a professional society of researchers and practitioners that see sustainability science as a, a recognized profession um, rather than these more siloed um, approaches. Right. Well, I mean, I would, I would even slightly contradict, even though I agree, because I mean, if we, if we would create an own profession we would create an own silo again. You know, if we have if we have sustainable sustainability as a science or as a as a professional area, then you would still have, you know, economics 
that would not totally disregard any, any kind of ecosystem science. And I think it's, it's more that we make certain things compulsory in different disciplines. You know, why, why do microeconomists only learn that people are a cost factor, that you, know, uh, you have to produce cheap, you have to maximize profit? Why are they not learning something else? Simply because they're in their own area, okay. nobody disturbs them. Yeah. So we have to get there. Angela, did you want to just add on? Yes, maybe you saw the recently a video by the founder of, uh, of uh, Alibaba who mm. went uh, retired very young, good for him. And he said that 50% of the, of the education should be based on uh, critical thinking, on uh, uh, problem solving, on so-called uh, soft skills. And I completely agree with that because what we are uh, we are wrong in terms of educators is that we are still using the same formats they were used after the World War II, basically, basically. Why we need to change a lot, think about the issue of, uh, of a nutrition or uh, things related to the human rights. I mean, really, we need to do it, but not in a new silo, but within, uh, within a, a program. So we need to educate educators, which is very difficult. Okay. Uh, Maybe that's one to throw into the, uh, to the conversation the next couple of days, but maybe it's uh, uh, sometimes we assume uh, that the education system is doing all the right things, but maybe it's actually reinforcing um, a part of the, uh, of the problem. I always, my other example is, uh, anyone from Austria here? I'm very, I always fascinated, I go to The View, which is the big economics traditional um, university in Vienna, and they've got a, an institute for sustainability uh, inside them. But, but it's just this little island surrounded by people pumping out orthodox economics, the next era, and the, the, the next kind of, kind of race that's going to be you know, looking after hedge funds and all the rest of it. I just think there's, a, there's, a, a, there's, a, there's an interesting challenge to be faced. I want to come on to this, uh, this interesting issue about further collaboration. Uh, what I'm hearing is that uh, politicians have got a lot on their agendas. We're hearing that we need politicians, policy makers to be creating the frameworks within which innovation uh, can take place and the right sort of innovation, so getting the incentives. But um, they're getting huge, mixed and contradictory sometimes, but complex messages from all over the place. I'm just interested maybe uh, building on uh, a little bit of what uh, Benjamin said, because uh, it feels as though you've recognized that we actually, you know, the more messages you have, the more you can choose one, not the other, and not do anything. And I'm just interested in exploring this a little bit further about um, uh, reinforcing collaboration that actually means we have a small number of very clear messages coming out, or whether by its nature this is a complex, uh, it is a complex field, and we just, look, what we're doing is fine. Uh, I'm, uh, or I'm just trying to work out whether, because I also hear the word urgency and scale, I'm trying to work out whether we need something more significant that makes it easy strategically for politicians to buy into, A, the crisis, but also that there are uh, there are solutions. Does anyone just want to comment further on this, this further collaboration, reinforcing, uh, or are we doing all we can be doing? Who wants to offer a comment on that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think you're, it's a very good question. I mean, I think there's, you know, I think the, at least from my perspective, certainly we're not doing everything we could be doing. And, and in fact, it, particularly at the global level, I don't even think we're really scratching the surface on what we should be doing in terms of collaboration. I think it's very disappointing. It, if you, for instance, if you look at some of the cities, I think cities have an excellent example of some really effective um, collaboration where you have truly have um, different groups from different disciplines that are addressing a common challenge and who decided to really put aside their personal agendas and embrace that common agenda and have even taken the step of having common frameworks, uh, common metrics, and, and I think that's very, very unique. I think what we see still at the global international level is that groups are very siloed. And in fact, even the networks tend to be somewhat uh, siloed. And I think that the discussion here is just uh, perhaps a demonstration of that. 
Um, I would hope, and I guess for the future, that we would really be able to start to break those down. I really like the concept of the Green EU, this project, the Innovation for Sustainable Development, in the sense that it's a network of networks. We're also involved in a few other projects that are network of networks, and one uh, is, is being chaired by uh, Paul Eakins. Um, I think this, frankly, is going to be potentially a very, very effective way for the, for the future, which is how do we start to get various groups to begin to collaborate, but in a much more demonstrable way through, um, through common metrics, right? Through a common agenda and through common metrics, and that's extraordinarily difficult. It takes a lot of time. So I guess the answer is we need to do things, and it's extremely messy. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, the problem is a bit the, the, the fact that, well, we use it in our language, and I think it has been used today, competitiveness. And I mean, competitiveness, unfortunately, is not necessarily the natural output of cooperation or the, you know. So, and I think we are actually facing also a, a crisis of multilateralism. I mean, if we look, all these, all these agreements, Paris and SDGs, are all based on voluntary action. They're, you know, Paris is asking for nationally determined contributions. And if you look then at competitiveness, of course, you know, we might not end up necessarily with a race to the bottom, but I would say with a very, if I, if I put it mildly, cautious approach by national governments in order not to basically, uh, you know, lose their competitive edge, uh, you know, in this traditional thinking. And if we have countries that are about to withdraw from the Paris Agreement that are having a major economic impact, then, of course, this, is, this is, could be quite detrimental and push, push us in a, in a quite opposite direction. And I think to overcome that via cooperation from, uh, from other levels might be a very hard job. Yeah, and maybe I was thinking because there are some good examples as well, and uh, maybe we should learn from them. Huh? So, for example, in the Netherlands, we have like more regional approach sometimes. Huh? So, for example, we're about to start a cooperation on the Gemmelot, this is the southern part, like in Limburg, there the province comes in, huh? also with, with uh, yeah, par part of money, of course, but also all the like industries are on the side there. So we have the big chemical companies, we have the waste companies, we have the university, we have TNO coming in, and there we're really going to show how it works, not only like in theory, but also in practice. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I was thinking maybe we could learn from that as well. I, do, I don't know exactly, to be honest, how we that also can take it further to the European or the world level, because that's of course, uh, but maybe you can duplicate it a little bit. Yes. Definitely, we need uh, to work together, that is for sure. And uh, I really trust youngsters. I think that, I mean, the more youngsters come on board and they lead uh, these networks and these activities, they are used to work together through the digital. I mean, we, we are not able to do that because we, are, we were born in a silo society. And I think that they are much more fluid. And I think that maybe I have a, a lot of trust in, in them. Uh, certainly some uh, some interesting uh, ideas around uh, uh, collaboration and networks. Uh, I was also struck by something you said, uh, Benjamin, that uh, you could say, oh, yes, we'll sign a piece of paper, we'll have a, you know, we'll have a new network. There is a danger that uh, networks are of organisations, I think, as you mentioned, Wolfgang, that are, in a sense, competing for resources, competing for space. I need to pay my staff. I need... You know, we all have a, a sort of reinforcing uh, sense of how do I keep my program, my activity going. And, uh, uh, and I wonder whether there's also something about that collaboration space that it's not just that, oh, I, we, you know, here's our 12 names that collaborate. Collaborate isn't about giving something up. It's almost daring, I think you mentioned, about redefining your organization's agenda. I just wonder whether there's some space within this collaboration thing, which isn't more stamp collecting of how many collaborations am I part of, but that leading potentially to some redefining of, of networks and organizations. You can only join a collaboration if you, if you give up something or, or you recognize someone else does something differently. I'm, I'm just interested, any other experience on the panel about the sort of dynamics of collaboration that make them 
of, of, of real value uh, rather than just a, a stamp collecting exercise. Hmm, Wendy. Well, I mean, I, I think um, collaboration is the key. I mean, these, these issues are, they're local, they're national, they're global. So we, we absolutely have to collaborate to solve them. And um, I think most of our networks that you know, are represented here have an extremely collaborative approach. So we, we are um, collaborating on key issues. We're also somewhat competing for space. I think, um, I think we do need better tools for collaboration, better platforms, sort of more open source style approaches to the way we work so that, you know, an advancement in one um, organizational area can actually directly be used by another. And, and I think some of the, the kind of collaborative platforms or the sort of the um, data platforms we have can actually be used to stimulate collaboration because, because um, each stakeholder or organization can see their role together mapped on the same, um, in, in the same tool. And yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Angela. Yes, I, I think that what we shouldn't do is uh, to do overlapping because uh, uh, sometimes there are too many analyses, too many, I mean, too much time spent in, uh, in, uh, to see which are the problems and less time on, on solutions. So maybe what we should do is to try to see which is our strategic agenda and to work in order to make agendas more coherent in the short, but especially in the middle, long, long term, because otherwise we start projects, maybe they were close to the ones started by others, and this is something that we, we shouldn't do. But I agree with you that compared to other fields, in this field there's more cooperation compared to others. So we need to work on it. Yeah, right. yeah maybe I was also triggered by another question, like in your first line, and uh, that was also what would the message be and can we get it more clear and transparent and more, more defined? And uh, maybe that also helps to make it a more worthwhile cooperation. Huh? If we could like make that like, um, how do I say that in English, um, more specific that we can really say, what does it contribute? Uh, how, how like can, can the parliament can, uh, can uh, at, take advantage of that in, in a positive way uh, and to do that? And that's extremely difficult. And I was also triggered by this morning that I was thinking, yeah, those entrepreneurs, I see them now also being enthusiastic for this topic, but they even should become more enthusiastic. And, and that, then we need to change something, I think, also in the way we approach people and in the way how we communicate uh, these kind of things to also make those networks more interesting for the new entrepreneurs, I would say. Right. Interesting. Wolfgang. Well, just on a, sh on a short note, I, I, I do not necessarily think that the collaboration between the networks is the real problem, but I, as I, I would still say the collaboration between governments, and I mean, I. We were talking a lot about markets here, and, and I mean, no market is unregulated, and I give you, could give you thousands of examples of maybe regulations that are not necessarily uh, uh, for, uh, of bringing, uh, you know, sustainability or asking for sustainable solutions. And the point is, I mean, this, this whole issue about creating level playing fields, you know, and, 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 and I think, of course, we are stronger if we align ourselves because we want also, we need to change basically the political agenda. And I think that, that definitely can only be done if we as, as kind of the, uh, you know, promoters of, of sustainable development are aligning and are, are putting up more pressure or as much pressure as possible. Okay. Uh, just one thought. Uh, uh, time is not our, our, our friend, and we're really just trying to, partly trying to stimulate the, the rest of the conference. But I'm just struck that, uh, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years now, would you believe it? Um, and every year seems to be a defining year. But it just feels to me that we are at this incredible pinch point where we've never had more knowledge of, of not only the problems we're creating, um, but the solutions that are available at a time when politics appears to be uh, have 
marginal appetite to really take it on. All this stuff is absorbed by, you know, the Department of Absorbing Interesting News rather than the core drivers of, 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 of governments. And I'm just wondering, maybe as a stimulation to the conference over the next two days, if we were to get, I don't know, it's either inspired, angry, real or something and saying we can carry on do our stuff collaborations very we've got to do all that we've got to innovate we've got to do research that's fine but we need to lob something of some extraordinary substance into the pond so that people do wake up either in an excited way or a worried way because otherwise it feels as though it's just kind of you know carrying on do we have any capacity as a set of networks that get it, see the problems, see the solutions, to do something more significant or just the world of iteration and different initiatives carries on? I'm just, I'm just wondered about respond to my urgency and scale ulcer that is growing here, okay? Anyone want to offer a, a thought? Yeah, Wendy. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that um, goes down to, um, we're, I think we are now screaming about the urgency of the climate problem and beginning to scream about the urgency of other sustainability problems. And um, I think inspiring um, everybody, the world, the politicians, people, um, entrepreneurs, innovators in, in realizing the uh, not the, the despair, but the potential of exponential action and what it can do and how we can change exponentially, but we need to act now to get that moving. I think, um, you know, the inspiring talk by, by Gabrielle, the, the, the recognition that it's not too late, but it is if we leave it any longer, I think can, can be um, a motivating factor to, 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 you know, provide people with, with you know, the, the hope, but also the motivation to, to, to address this. I, I can see the value. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in whether there is some practical something beyond what we're doing at the moment, um, which may be perhaps further discussed at this, this event. Benjamin. Thank you. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very good question. It's a very tough question. I, I think it's very difficult for the networks to do that thing um, unless you address the underlying incentives of the partners that form the network. And I think this is a point that I believe Paul was also making when he, when he pointed out that the incentives sometimes for innovation are very clear. The incentives around addressing socioeconomic challenges sometimes are less clear. I mean, one of the things that clearly incentivizes the members of our network, the Green Growth Knowledge Platform, the 60 partners, is donor funding. That is a clear incentive, right? Where do they actually receive their funding? Um, I think Horizon 2020 is unique in that it has insisted on some sort of collaborative element in all of its projects, right? I think that is quite unique in the donor space. I think it's been um, uh, somewhat successful in that. I think there are many examples where um, institutions just sign up, they sort of do their own, they have their own personal agenda, it's wrapped up in a nice narrative and, and given uh, back. I think that probably more could be done, even though Horizon 2020 is at the vanguard of promoting this kind of collaborative effort. They could even insist more that these institutions really sit down and work together with a common agenda and have common metrics to test their uh, success. And that's just the beginning. I mean, I think if, if the donors in particular insisted on it, we would see much more effective collaboration right. on the ground. Okay. That's interesting. We're right at the uh, end of this discussion, but I want to come along my uh, panel um, just for one final message that might galvanize discussions through the next two and a half days. And as part of that message, I just want to check every single one of these things I seem to be involved in talks about growth in transition, transition in growth, partnerships for growth, sustainable growth, growth in growth, growth, growth. Um, is, does this have to be the narrative to get politicians on board that growth, growth, jobs has to be it? Or, or, is that, or, or have we actually got, got part of the narrative wrong uh, here? So I'm worried I'm going to open up a deep philosophical discussion. One message to our wonderful uh, set of participants, but almost just maybe a comment on growth. 
I'm going to start at the far end. Um, Marinka. Uh, my message would be, and then also for the communication to, to further uh, get all the entrepreneurs here, get all the younger, because also like on this table, I mean, uh, I don't know the age of you, but uh, I assume you're about the same age as me, which is being 50. Huh? So we really should have an attractive <laughs> a message for the rest of the world, I would say. And, and, and let's help also the younger people and entrepreneurs, let's help them to get that message across. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, I, mean I, I would still see that, that uh, you know, the, the collaboration on the local level, I, and, and I'm saying that with all costs, we are not the only ones. So, so there are many, many uh, networks around this, uh, around the world who would potentially say the same, uh, you know, where people can really have an impact directly. And I think that that is that is the key as a as a learning laboratory that that you can make people part of of the change and they can see the impact. This is not easy, but I think it's worthwhile. And particularly, I think young people are really open to that. Make them engaged and let them really shape their future by themselves. Yeah, and what I think, what, thinking about this conference in particular and the innovations communities, I, I, I think the, the key to our future lies with the innovations communities and I think collaboration with the science communities as well as policy communities is, is fundamental for, for that to be enabled and to be enabled in the right direction. So in the direction of sustainability, but also we need, we need policy incentives to... Um, in, encourage and enable the, the um, innovators um, to innovate in the right direction. For our conference next three days. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that um, I think that the networks that, that are represented here and the others that, that are that are joining us today. I mean, I think we're now at a stage of maturity and also a stage of stability where we need to re. Um, examine our, our, our ability to, uh, to work together. Um, I think that there are some incredible opportunities out there, but it is going to take each of us to actively engage and to, to, try, to um, try to identify those. Right, maybe a bit, little bit of internal disruption is what's uh, required as well. Okay, Angela, finally. There was an ad on uh, The Economist a few days ago saying, by an investment fund, saying sustainability revolution. So what I would like to underscore is that business starts to be interested in these issues because they see opportunities and they see ways to mitigate risks. So we as uh, organizations, we need to support them and we need also to collaborate in order to do it better because we need to talk to them in a new way. We need to be stronger, politically stronger, and if, if we are united, we can do it. Vote for me. Thank you very much. And maybe that is uh, one of the issues for us to discuss is the nature of those collaborations and the partners within it. Certainly my experience over the last two years is uh, extraordinarily the sustainable development goals appear to be getting a, a level of traction among certainly large corporations and many others that I was way beyond what I expected. So maybe there's, there are some, some friends and new alliances, challenging may be, but of high value, and we maybe need to be starting to think, you know, who are our players? And because uh, once some uh, uh, big players get it, it's amazing, as we've seen today, how fast things can change. Um, thank you very much uh, to our panelists. You'll be contributing, I think, through uh, the uh, next couple of days uh, in the conference. We hope we've softened up some thoughts, some ideas for uh, agendas. Um, but for now, uh, thank you very much uh, to our speakers. And I think we might clear the platform because we're going to make way um, for Fernando because I think I just feel we need a global initiative of knowledge and in innovation in support of the SDGs. Have you got anything up your sleeve there, Fernando? You might have. So thank you very much to our panellists. Thank you.
Thank you very much for being here. Um, I was very tempted to go entrepreneurial and sitting over there, but I, I just noticed that it's uh, challenging with the microphone. And because I'm going to ask uh, two of our guests to, to join me uh, at the stage, um, to the ambassador from Mexico, Mr. Escanero, and Heber Gebrandi, he is about to return to the, to the venue. But uh, what I want to share with you, it's, it's, it's how we are planning to move forward uh, and, and how we think uh, our initial step, a really, really modest step can be given if we, if we, if we create an open platform for collaboration and, and, and then a way to start is by, by, having, uh, by having knowledge and, 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 and information uh, together in, in a platform that can be accessed for all. Uh, with all the limitations we face and with all the challenges we face, uh, this is just one way to start. Um, so we've been hearing today, and I'm very thankful for all of you, keynote uh, speakers, panelists, all of our guests coming from many different countries, um, the tremendous amount, of, uh, the tremendous amount of, uh, of effort that was put in traveling, also CO2 emissions, I'm afraid. Uh, but uh, there is, there is uh, some of you travel really far from, from, from other continents, from Japan, from Korea, from, 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 from Chile, from Mexico, from Canada, from the U.S. And uh, some of us, we are based in Europe, and, uh, and then we had a bit of a less, uh, of, a less of, a, of a travel, but nonetheless, with all of our busy agendas, it is, it is really uh, so important for us that all of you are here. It, this is not a massive event in the sense that uh, these initiatives, uh, like-minded people, like-minded initiatives, uh, we think that put, by putting them together is a mandate that the European Commission has given us by creating and supporting this project. Uh, we, we, we can start figuring out how to thanks to move into action and into solutions. So uh, without further uh, delay, what I'm going to show you, I don't, I don't mean to give you a lecture, but I'm going to share with you, after everything we've spoken today, uh, we are, I feel that we in Europe are very privileged of, of what we have because we have knowledge, we have means, and we are, in general, we are better off than other parts of the world. And um, InnoforSD has been created as an initiative that aims at tackling uh, this issue of knowledge fermentation because we are all working in the same things, but we call it differently. So what, what, um, going to, what I'm going to present you is, is, really, is really, if it is true that... Um, if it, is true that, uh, if it is true that policies can, can play a role in promoting innovation, and if innovation, whichever form we give it, social, circular, environmental, low carbon, if it is true that there is a way of, 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 of creating somehow a virtual cycle in the economy, because we still, in the way the production and consumption system and the global economy are shaped, we still need uh, economic outputs, and, and we still need growth to some extent or degrowth. I don't, I, that's a debate I don't want to go into, but if it is true that innovation can play a role in a low-carbon economy, in a just economy, in a circular economy, and by doing that we are contributing to the global goals of sustainability, climate, uh, and, and resource, and, 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 and try to tackle the ecologic and humanitarian crisis that we are facing, well, um, what, 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 what comes uh, to mind and, and in terms of challenges and opportunities? And is it really true that innovation is only about SDG number nine? So is it really true that uh, in innovation is technology? We believe in InnoforSD that is not. Uh, innovation is not only about SDG nine. Innovation is not only about technology. Innovation is about creating value. Value not in, this, in the neoclassical sense of creating economic value only. We still need business to, to, set, to, 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 to identify the business case, but we need societal value and environmental value. And, and uh, today, all, all the messages, all the interventions, the expectations that technology can play, of course, is important, but we also mentioned today that we need behavioral change and we need new forms of collaboration. We need new public-private partnerships. So, uh, sadly, uh, when we are talking in Europe or we are talking in this session uh, about the SDGs, uh, we actually are far from, from the local reality, from the reality of many people in the world who are actually living under a dollar a day. So people who are, um, people who are, um, just roll, people who are starving, uh, people who are, uh, you know, malnutrition, uh, uh, people who are uh, not, having, not having a place to study, not having the means to study. Uh, 
uh, being unequally paid, being unequally treated, being um, uh, not having access to basic services of as, as of clean water, uh, not having uh, not having energy electricity in your homes to 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 to, to be warm or, or to be you know to be able to study at night, uh, working conditions which are not uh, appropriate for um, uh, living your family. We think that yeah, in a we can contribute to something, but innovation is so abstract and so difficult to untangle that the challenge that we have and we have put on, on ourselves is, is really big. But if we continue thinking about if, if it's really true that, um, that uh, we, we, can, we can tackle inequalities, uh, we, can, we can actually help with overpopulated cities, uh, if we can think of, of doing something with the, the sad environmental pollution that we are still causing, if we think of, 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 the, of the climate adaptation and, and, and then things that are costing cities and taxpayers thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, you know, devastation of reefs. Uh, when, when I think about all of this, uh, you know, all the, all the amount of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of animals and, and species that are actually extinct or going extinct at a pace exponential as well. Uh, mobilizing, you, you may hear now in, in Central America the, all this, uh, you know, humanitarian situation that is happening and then how we are not treating it well. Um, it, is, it is true that with these kind of events, can we do anything meaningful? Can we actually enact change? We believe we can. Uh, we, we want to keep on the op optimistic side. Of course, we have to take a stand. And our stand as Innofresi is knowledge, it's about education, it's about research, it's about evidence-based based policy making, it's about you know, unpacking those concept and complex and abstract messages that are being out there about why regulation should work, why public partnerships should work, why new business models may or may not work, and put them and translate them into solutions that can actually help those people who are not lucky as we are, uh, to help nature. Uh, only a couple countries in the world actually have given constitutional rights to nature, equally, equally, equally at, at the equal level uh, than, than humans. So we live in a human-centered society that, that well, we, we've taken that, uh, that role for ourselves. So I don't want to be super, optim super pessimistic with this, but uh, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to show you uh, is what, sadly, uh, we don't think about often, enough and what is the, the it's not that we are responsible for that obviously we are responsible for ourselves we are responsible for our work we are responsible for the initiatives that we lead but if there is anything we can do I think it makes sense to do it together now uh, Inno for SE, uh you've been hearing about Inno for SE. we've been e emailing you we've been contacting you we, we've been uh, we've been uh, uh, chasing you, please uh, uh, come to our event. Uh, InnoforEZ is a global initiative uh, started and funded by the European Commission that will enter into a phase where we will uh, need to become sustainable in its own right. And if it is, if it is uh, the will of governments and partners of working together, the, the, the team behind this uh, initiative is willing to do so. So... We are not aiming to do everything, but if we, if we manage to bring together networks, entities, and individuals in this field of innovation for sustainable development, and we try to put the pieces of the puzzle together in terms of knowledge, and if we support collaboration, and then we engage with other stakeholders, that in itself is already a big, uh, a big mission. Uh, some of our panelists were telling us what were the preconditions of collaboration. Of course, we cannot, we cannot do the same, but we need to look at complementarities. And one important thing of our mission and how we do it is, well, just uh, about, uh, about uh, a number of services, connecting people, providing knowledge, or putting the knowledge in the right place, or in the place where we think or we've been asked it could be more useful, and guiding uh, decision-based uh, or science-based policy making. So I'm not going to bore you with any of these. This is our, propos or our proposition for the, for, the, for the coming three years. Run a number of services and, uh, and then um, this, is, this, is the, 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 this is the people behind this initiative. Leading scholars, scientists, practitioners that have been working with, with innovation, eco-innovation, social innovation for about 20 or 30 years. And, uh, and if there is anything we can contribute to 
statistical offices, to parliaments, to city level officials who are willing to do so. Uh, Mr. Hebrandi, please join us um, right in time uh, for this last part of the session. So just, just, to, just to move on and to tell you that today we are very happy to announce that um, thank you. We, we, are, we, are, we are happy to announce a few flagship initiatives that, that require little resources and lots of will for collaboration. One of them is a global initiative on learning and innovation for SDGs, which is an open access platform that we put at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, in the hands of all of you. And we, uh, we put a, a knowledge uh, repository of innovation for SDGs. We don't want to duplicate things. Uh, UN Technology Facilitation Mechanism is already creating a, an online platform. You can search what people is doing with technology. We feel that technology is one of the many things, very important, but it's not the only way of achieving uh, sustainable development goals, climate action, resource efficiency, and, and, and a more just and, and, and inclusive economy. So what I will show you now, and basically we are inviting you to, to join us in this journey that will last uh, two or three years until we, we consolidate this initiative, uh, is, is to, to join and, and, and if you think that your organizations, whether from the knowledge perspective, from government, uh, from government perspective, from decision-making perspective, are aligned and they have a similar way of thinking than us, uh, we will have in our website, I will show you in a second, a declaration like many others, but this declaration shouldn't be just a collection of stamps. We really want to, to, to at least be able to promote action to whichever level we can, we can, we can achieve. And, and, and this is just a start for us. And the way we want to start, and, and for that I will ask my colleague Simon to uh, not on those websites, but on, on the. I, I want to. I want you to go to your mobile phones or, and and, and then type, new .net. This is uh, this is our new website, and basically this is this is something that we've been waiting for. And today is uh, is basically we are coming to an end from being a project from the European Commission, to being a global initiative that if you if you if you if you if you think it's valuable. We want, to, we want you to be part of it. So what you saw before is in this website. Uh, we start somewhere in English. Uh, next step, we'll do it in Spanish, because we have a surprise for you for next year. Uh, Dutch will think uh, how to make it as well, and in all the EU languages and UN languages. Um, it's a challenge. But uh, what, I want to, what I want to show you is that in this, this global initiative that we're launching is not just about collecting stamps. It's about learning what is needed where you live in the organization that you work for, what you can do to contribute to global change. Um, the next step. Um, and this initiative is basically starting today. Um, we have at our new website, we, we have, uh, we have um, a, a dedicated section for this. We are working with all of the partners and we will be working with them in the coming months uh, with all of the partners and with all of, all of you that were in this, in this session that have been part of this journey of four years. We've been to the Mediterranean region, we've been to Africa, we've been to Latin America, we've been, to, uh, you know, we've been in, in Brussels twice. So we want to invite you if, you, if you, if you think that there are ways to connect and to contribute. What we want to do in particular, when, when we talk about SDGs, there is already lots of information out there. So I, I often ask city officials and practitioners, if, I, if, you, if you're given 5,000 euros or dollars or whatever currency is, and you need to implement something for sustainability, what do you do with it? And obviously, sense of priority is different, but uh, uh, Simon, in the, in the next step, uh, we think that if information is available, if knowledge is available, and we share uh, our, I want to call it wisdom, or if we share our, 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 our knowledge and our, our, our best practices and our mistakes as well, because we learn a lot about mistakes, but we often don't talk about them much. Just, for example, click in, uh, in number one, no poverty. This is not material that we have produced ourselves. This is material that's freely available on this uh, web browser that started in which year, Gabriel? In 1980-something in the UK, I believe. It was, uh, it was a UK... Uh, inventor, and, uh, and then we, we, want, we want people to, to make this an open source repository, and this is just our first step. So uh, you can click on publications. Um, 
right now we just identify a number of them and this is a, this is work in progress and, and this is something that we want it to be in, in as many languages as possible and then we have some some resources uh, uh, because we think that uh, well access to information and and action to tutorials right, right now it's, 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 it's important but now this is just for those who have access to internet eh? and this is for those who can actually read in English so we know that's why I was telling you at the beginning that this is just a tiny little effort of we want to do what we think can can help a lot and that's why I have invited Ambassador Escanero and, and, and Mr. Gebrandi is um, to, 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 to be there today is that we need to promote these dialogues more often. Uh, we were in, in, in many places in the world uh, and entrepreneurs, scientists, students coming to us and telling us, you know what, I've just changed my mind. I'm, my, my master thesis won't be about, uh, about, uh, about marketing. My master thesis will be about green marketing. And, uh, and then we, we've been talking to entrepreneurs and say, listen, uh, forget about my, my shoes. I want to make circular shoes but I don't know where to start. So, or, or people coming to us from a cooperative of peasants uh, saying, listen, we have a problem of fungus and then we, we've heard that in other parts of, 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 of the Caribbean, they, they found a way to, to, without using pesticides, they found a way of treating the fungus that is in our banana. So information is there, but dialogues allow us to, 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 to be in contact with that knowledge and exchange because of that. Uh, we have an announcement to make back to the presentation and, and uh, InnoForesi will continue with our online presence but also uh, next year we will host our fifth annual symposium in Mexico. We have secured partnerships uh, with a number of local institutions, the Center for Social Innovation, the Ibero-American University, Green Momentum, CleanTech Challenge which are present here with us with a number of uh, institutions and academic network like Roots for Sustainability and we invite you to be part of it. Um, and next to Mexico, obviously, we don't want to wait for a year, so we will, we will try to establish other collaboration, other fora, uh, and that's why uh, we have now that uh, our, 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 our good friend Ambassador, he says that, yes, this, uh, this is something that we, we would very much welcome, and we will look also to engage the, 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 the Senate and the Parliament, uh, and the Interparliamentary Union, to make it a bit more, uh, to be, to, you know, to, to, to link, the, to link the, the, the bottom, sorry, the local level, to the, the bottom up to the top down. So maybe, uh, Ambassador, you want to tell us uh, uh, a few words uh, why they should come to Mexico. Well, thank you very much, Fernando. And, uh, let me first congratulate you for the launching of this global initiative uh, of knowledge and innovation in support of SDGs. We believe uh, that we all, uh, the relevant actors, from the public sector, from the private sector, from the science, academia, uh, business, society, society, uh, civil society, all of us together have to address in a holistic manner the challenge of making sure that innovation uh, and technology serve the purpose that we have uh, set up for ourselves at the United Nations for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2030 for Development. And we believe that the, uh, your uh, network and all the partners that are represented here in this symposium are precisely uh, providing the right platforms for this uh, communication, for this exchange of information. So we are extremely pleased by your announcement. The only thing I would like to uh, say to all of you to your network and to all the, uh, the institutions in the, and networks and individuals present here, that you are most welcome to come to Mexico. We, we are looking forward to work together with you as partners with the European Parliament, with European institutions in a task that is uh, ahead for all of us, a task, that, a task that belong to all of us, the common challenge of making sure that we align the incredible, amazing, uh, developments in science and technology in support of uh, uh, sustainable and equitable development for all at global scale. So congratulations again and welcome to Mexico, all of you, the coming year. Let's, let's take stock there of great advances and uh, making sure that all your effort during this year gets uh, a further push there in Mexico the coming year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. 
And uh, some, of you, some of you know me, some of you know that I was born in Mexico, but I became a Dutch national uh, not long ago. So I have my heart uh, in, two, in two places, and this is why also the, 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 the Dutch, uh, the Dutch uh, parliamentarians, the Dutch government have been so kind, not only because we're based in the Netherlands as TNO coordinators of this initiative until January 31st, 2019. After that, we will need to work on a, on a, on a package of how, how the governance will work. And we are extremely thankful for um, Parliamentarian Hebrandi, and he will, he will uh, close the event with, uh, with a few words and, and a few remarks about uh, what we have uh, discussed and, and the challenge we have ahead. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Fernando, and uh, thank you, Ambassador, for, for being with us and being so active in this field and inviting everyone to be in Mexico next year. Um, first of all, before I, I start going into any content, I hope you listened very carefully to um, Paul Eakins, and I also hope that you agree with him that um, we should dare to fail and that we should also accept failure. Mm -hmm. Because as host, I failed miserably. I don't think there is, there is anything worse than organizing a meeting like this without serving any coffee. So my <clears throat> apologies for that, um, and uh, I hope it will be my last failure in this uh, sense. Um, I think the, the, the main issue in these kind of debates is um, what is the sense of urgency? And um, that is nothing new to you. You're all fully aware of this, uh, of the huge sense of urgency. Uh, urgency. I, I uh, listened up to you, and I, I think I could could feel a huge sense of urgency in all presentations that we are about to die as human species if we are not doing what you all told us to do in in the coming years, months, and and days. And sense of urgency in, in politics, I'm afraid, is a very difficult one. I'll give you one example. The representative of the European Commission this morning talked about that sustainable development is at the heart of EU policies. But the latest proposal <coughs> towards sustainable finance is actually a very tiny incremental step because it means that we are going to green about 5% of the financial services in the EU, which means that 95% is still working against that 5% that is green. And that, as far as I'm concerned, is not showing a lot of sense of urgency. No, the sense of urgency means that we have to sustain the full 100% of our financial uh, system. And that is, I think, the challenge um, that lies ahead of us. And, of course, <clears throat> Several people said also that um, it cannot come from the private sector alone. Governments play a very crucial role in this, and I fully agree. But if we look around in the world, we see people like Trump, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, Putin in, um, in Russia. We see populist movements also uh, within the EU that are not very keen on this in environmental agenda. So um, instead of increasing the sense of urgency, you now quite often see at national level, political level, you see the sense of urgency uh, going down. And that, of course, is a huge problem. It might even put the question on the table whether the system that we have created that we call democracy is in itself fit to uh, such a challenge that we're facing today. The radical transition towards a sustainable, uh, sustainable economy, which goes against so many vested interests, is so huge that it's still to be seen whether democracy is fit for that challenge. And I'm an optimist, so I think it is fit. It's fit at international level, and it's certainly fit at local level to uh, face those challenges. The problem is national level, and unfortunately, quite often, the national level is still um, uh, the most influential one. But it's something that we should, that we should work on. I'm optimistic, well, based on, on several issues, based on meetings like this, uh, but also based on, on political reality. Um, 
Two weeks ago, we voted in this House on uh, legislation that's going to prohibit single-use plastics in many, many areas, something I couldn't dreamt of, uh, I wouldn't say years ago, not even a few months ago. I thought this is, this is going to be extremely difficult to get this through Parliament, but it was adopted almost unanimously. And those who voted against were a few right-wing movements in this House who felt completely isolated. So that is, that is a very um, a promising um, element. Um, the economy is leading, of course, and that is also a problem. Um, innovation cannot only be driven by the economy, by financial profit, as was emphasized by several of you, but also by societal profit. And I think that is, that is the biggest challenge um, that we're having. It also means that if we talk about uh, green innovation, the simple fact that an alternative to something that we use now is greener is not enough. It will not be sufficient in nowadays society to say, okay, we will replace current technology by a similar technology, but that is green. No, it has also to improve our daily life. And I think that is, that is um, um, uh, also important. Uh, Gabrielle's rocket, it's, it's a wonderful thing, and I'm certain that it's going to happen in the end. Um, but it will only work if it's also uh, a greener solution than uh, the airplanes that we're using now. So it will be not only greener, but it will also be much faster. And that is, I think, the key key for success. Why will the combustion engine uh, run out of its life? Because clean engines like electric vehicles or, or um, hydrogen vehicles will be technolo technologi technologically speaking superior and it will improve our lives. And I think that is the main reason why uh, they will replace the com combustion engine um, uh, quite quickly. And then Finally, um, I think it's obvious that technology that's being developed will be used. So the Gabriel's rocket will be used because it's being developed and it's improving our lives and it, it, it will be used. The big challenge is to make it even greener than uh, the current technology. I was in China last week and I came back optimistic. Um, because I believe in the Chinese agenda uh, called Beautiful China and the shift that's taking place, um, uh, moving away from uh, quantity towards quality. I think it's a genuine move um, and it, it will certainly happen. But even there you see that daily life plays a role as well. We, we discussed um, the aviation sector there and despite all the wonderful words by the Chinese delegation on, on sustainability, they said that limiting um, the growth in aviation um, was not going to happen from uh, the position of China because all 1.4 billion Chinese had to ride uh, for transport and that includes aviation, even if it's, if it's not sustainable. So um, there you see that uh, the only way forward if we, is if we develop the technology and um, that, is, that is cleaner and cleaner. Um, innovation is not only technology. Uh, that was emphasized as well this morning. It's also culturally. I fully agree with that. And where many of you said that um, governments are necessary to... Uh, incentivize the right innovation. I fully agree with that, but I would like to turn it around as well. I'm afraid that politicians need the new technology, culturally and, uh, and in, in, in technical terms, in order to embrace um, clean innovation. Because only when it's, uh, it has the, the, the prospect of improving people's life most politicians will be brave enough to, to fight for it. Otherwise, they'll fear to be voted out of, uh, of office at the next elections. So there I think we are, um, well, in the same basket. We need each other very strongly, 
I hope that we politicians will be um, brave enough to support and continue supporting clean uh, innovation as we're doing now and are even going to step up. And I hope that the uh, uh, innovative sector is going to deliver us the right instruments in order to be voted into office uh, next time again, in order to, um, to even uh, increase our joint efforts. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, giving me the, the opportunity to host this event. It was a huge and huge uh, privilege for me and an honor. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, cooperating in the future and I hope it will be as successful as today's meeting. And I wish you a very, very um, good two days to come uh, here in Brussels. Thank you. We have some practical announcements. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much to everybody for, for being here. Uh, Peter will uh, just give us some instructions for those staying for those remaining two days. And um, to the rest of you, thank you very much for being in Brussels today. And we're certainly going to follow up and, 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 and bring those ideas into, into practical, uh, practical actions. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, so um, a practical thing number one is go and get a coffee. Uh, number two, uh, dinner uh, for those who've registered is at uh, Chez uh, Léon and it's uh, dinner at um, 8 o'clock. And if you've registered for that, uh, go to the back because there's a voucher you can take from the registration desk. Uh, we have a live registration desk that's waving, so that's good. Keep waving. That's lovely. Okay. Um, for those who've uh, said they'd like to uh, visit uh, the Parliament, um, Go to the visitor's entrance and you will have, uh, again, uh, registered your interest in doing that. Um, go to the visitor's entrance, um, which says um, Hemicycle Visits for 15.45. Um, and that's only for uh, those among the speakers who've registered to go on that visit. But it is fascinating to see the, uh, the, um, uh, the hemicycle and all that's going on in the Parliament. Uh, beyond that, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, 8.30 for a 9 uh, o'clock start, uh, where we really further develop some of the discussions, agendas, and all the rest of it over the next two days. So uh, enjoy Brussels, and we'll see you, if uh, nowhere else, tomorrow morning, 8.30 for 9. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Peter, Peter, yeah. for, for those who are desperately in need for a quick coffee, <laughs> at the third floor there is a bar where you can get coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. I think that's the best I have to offer. Good. It's good for us.